And just, you know, when you're so pissed and you're just like, it's not going to work. So you're just going to like, fuck it. I'm just going to send it and hopefully I snap my neck so I never have to do this again. <laughs> you are listening to the bomb hole. It's going to be very hot. It's going to be very uncomfortable for everybody. <laughs> that bitch is crazy. All right, another week, another bomb hole. We got a special guest in the goop booth. We also have another guest. We got a fly that's cruising around. The we, fly. The fly. We named him. What do we name him, buds? Jeff Goldblum. Jeff Goldblum, the fly, is in the booth with us. <laughs> he is not leaving. <laughs> and we also have Mikey. LeBlanc. Wow. Big Mike. What's up, guys? Good what's going you. on, man? Good to see you, Bo. How are you? You know, great. It's really good to see some friendly faces, man. Is probably, I mean, honestly, in two months, I've seen two people outside of my girl and our kid, and that's Caleb, who was your one of the most recent guests. Ah, Loved his, mm-hmm. uh, his, his, his bomb hole was sick. But other than him, you're it. Really? Yeah, I've been hiding out. You've been doing it legit. Doing nothing. Keeping COVID free though. Yeah, COVID free. That's in dope. Way to be responsible. Yeah, yeah that's, that's sick. Right. Got to do it. I only see bombhole guests and Chris, so yeah. and my wife. That's about that's it. Great. And your dog Uno. Well, and the Seven Eleven employees, my local Seven <laughs> Eleven. Yeah, I'm I heard. Definitely... I heard about your life saving. I wanted to personally thank you. That's a cool. I told my girl about that story. Ah, uh, yeah, that very I, cool. That was man. a good, good feeling. Yeah. So we're Talk looking at a trifecta of East Coasters here, right? Uh, your main original. Mainer, yeah. Main, main guy. Maniac. Whereabouts in Maine? Uh, I grew up in a little town called Topsom, which is near Brunswick, which is near Portland. And it's basically a cool little town. It's like a, it's a naval base town. And then we have fishermen and hippies and serious rednecks. But like everybody mashed up, made for a very cool experience. You got the Navy brats from all over the world. As far as Maine goes, a little bit of ethnic kind of diversity, which is not common in the, you know, in Maine. Yeah. Um, and then fishermen just have a really cool vibe. It's just kind of like I worked on fishing wharfs and stuff. So like just men of the sea, you know, and then rednecks, farmers um, and hippies, like real hippies. That's a crazy mix. Yeah, it's a great mix. <laughs> you get in big trouble if you go swipe some lobsters or what? Oh, yeah. yeah I mean, you get that's shot. A, that's a big deal. You, you get, get shot. shot. Yeah, shotguns for spear sure. Gun? Spear gun? Or probably, spear gun to the jugular. <laughs> probably salt in the shotgun. Really? No, for real. I mean, they'll get you a I'm working on the wharf, dude. I straight up, like, I was working as, like, a, you know, I'd shovel fish head, sell bait, and buy lobsters. I never was on a boat. I was on the wharf. So, this is like your teen job. A wharf rat. Yeah. What, what is a wharf for people? It's like the dock. A right? wharf rat. So, I was a wharf rat. Wharf is like where, you know, boats come out of. And my job was like unloading bait trucks. You'd show up at four in the morning. A bait truck with all this dead fish would dump. My job was like holding the barrel and shaking it so you get more in the barrel. And while this is happening, you're completely being splattered with fish blood, guts, and scales. So at the end of that, so you would get 200 bucks cash for an hour's of work. But yeah. trust me, it was worth Every penny that you're getting. You uh, go home smelling like fish. I mean, I never got the fish smell off you me. You still but, smell like fish. Bro. Yeah. <laughs> but one time I was working on the wharf, dude, and, like, it's super territorial. So this guy, we see this boat coming in, and we're like, who's this fucking boat? Like, this guy's, and that's not one of our boats. Who's this kook? And it comes up, and the closer he gets, we're seeing he's going like this, and there's, like, a stick. And someone had taken what's called a gaff, which is, like, a 10-foot wooden staff with a super the sharp hook. metal hook it someone had gaffed him through the skull and out the eyeball oh, because what? because he had set over their traps Damn. like they had laid their traps over someone else and they gaffed him in the head for it. so that's like pretty it's territorial for sure man. that's not against the law to be gaffing get the gaff i think the next rule is in the fisherman world like you're not a, if you're you blowing don't it you're blowing it you don't narc yeah that's just that's part the of most it. main shit i've ever heard in my life yeah, the guy took dude. a gaff to the head yeah <laughs> Out through the eye, dude. That is. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think we asked him. You want to call the police? He's like, No. What are you talking about? He knows he can't be calling no, the police. Man. Next thing, he'll have the concrete sneaks on. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Damn. Yeah. So Maine's cool. Where'd you guys grow up? You're Mass. Yep. Mass hole. And you're Vermont. Okay, so you're super smart and liberal and stuff. Mm-hmm. Hippie. Educated. Yep. A lot of psychedelics in my youth. <sighs> yeah, I mean, you must. I did a little time in Connecticut when I was really young, and that place is kind of whack. Not a fan. Yeah. Not a fan. Yeah. I would say it's like Connecticut, the, New York, and then Vermont for the formative years. Yep. The Connecticut's just kind of a waste. Of, it's almost like it. It's almost closer to New York. Yeah. In some aspects, like because New England, you got Maine, 
Massachusetts, Vermont, New Hampshire, and uh, they had the hard whalers though. That was tight. Yeah, Rhode Island is a little hockey, but yeah, Vermont mostly from like sixth grade up or something. Yeah, Vermont dudes are mellow. I mean, if I think about all the pro shreds out of Vermont, you've got obviously a bunch of contest kids. You got the resorts, but then like the the filmer dudes, you got like Lucas Huffman. Oh, true. Kind of these ethereal, really focused, mentally driven, but yeah, creatives, and then mass. We dudes. got brushy too. Brushy, yeah, brushy, also super out there, creative, and then the mass dudes are always like so driven, like they got their chance and they're taking it. You know what I mean? All we the get, mass we dudes. Could, I could l- rifle off a couple for the Massachusetts yeah. Heritage. We got uh, Big Mountain Jeremy Jones. A lot of people don't know wow. that. Yeah, we I got didn't Todd realize. Richards. Yep. Uh, we got Scott Stevens. Yep. Um, damn, who else? I mean, we got Chris Beresford, Dan yep. Shades. We've had him on. Uh, we got Cole Navin, Mike yep. Rav- Ravelson yep. on the younger generation. Um, God, there's so many other people I'm forgetting. A lot of assholes. But they, they're kind of, you know, yeah. quite a few. Not a lot of Mainers. No. It's a few. Chip. Mainz just Our buddy Chip. 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 Justin Kennison. Yeah. Is Jill from Maine? Jill no. Perkins? I don't uh, who, think. There's a, from some California. from Maine, too, that I know. I'm, there's I'm definitely some it. other people from Maine that were shredded. Yeah, right? not a lot. I mean, there was a couple heads that were kind of in the mix way back, but they never really blew up. Yeah, never made it. Huh? Yeah, they never mained it. Any jib towns? <laughs> who? Never made it. Like towns people go, go to jibbing. Portland. I mean, you can go there. I I mean, it's just not. We've a lot. looked around, but it's not a lot. Yeah. So you, growing up, Maine, like you start snowboarding. How did you kind of like? Pursue it higher. How did that? What did that look like as a kid and stuff? All right, Maine. I yeah, mean, you got for, resorts in Maine. Yeah, yeah Sunday oh, River. Yeah. So I started wow. shredding before any resort allowed snowboarding in Maine. So I got into it some skateboarding. Saw a picture of Caballero and Thrasher. I was like, "Whoa, we can't skate in the winter, or we do skate in the winter, but it sucks because the mini ramp has ice on the flat and you eat shit." So uh, yeah, I mean, we first started, and then Sunday River and Sugarloaf opened one chair. And that was like one run, one chair. So, yeah, I mean, coming out of Maine, there was a couple heads back in the day. There was like a, you know, I don't know why, but like some of the brands back east, it was like an east-west thing. You had Sims in the west. East Coast was obviously Burton, but there was like Mistral was the big one. They yes. sponsored a lot of people. So we had a lot of that. Um, look was out there. But, yeah, Maine was cool. It was like. Honestly, I did 99% of my snowboarding was either, like, at the hill that I could walk to from, like, my house in 10 minutes or behind my high school. Just, like, a hill, no, not a resort, right? Yeah, just a hill. Yeah. I mean, we had a, a hill to a hockey rink where they snowed. They, like, it was an outdoor hockey rink, so they would plow it, and then there was these banks. So we'd build, like, quarter pipes and oh, sick. hip jumps and stuff. And Yeah, it was almost all that. I mean... Pre Maine is icy, dude. I mean, Maine is like cold as fuck. If you're a good snowboarder in the east, it's cold, it's ice. Like, the, I remember staring through like two feet of blue ice. You could see the grass through it. Like, I believe they, they so call we, it a boilerplate guy. I mean, we didn't do jumps. I mean, our whole thing was like we would go see how many runs we could get in an hour. And we had like, I was like four foot eight and was riding at Burton M6, which is essentially a race board that was yeah. like 165. And we would try to get, like, 10-plus runs in an hour going, like, 90 miles an hour down the, tra- the trail. That was what was going on, you know? That's so, insane. Yeah, it was fun. For an era. I remember well, those M3 or yeah. M boards or whatever, those Burton race boards. Yeah, and I traded it for a Micro Kelly, and I saw, to me, the GOAT, Terry A, posted a photo just yesterday about uh, his one of his favorite boards is the Micro Kelly, and that nice. board was, I got that board, I traded my M6 for the, for the micro Kelly with the air bindings. Cause before the air bindings, it was these wrap around top strap, three strap knee slash shin breaking bindings. And the air binding came out. It's kind of like the Sims binding, but yeah. the Sims had that going before, but the Sims, when you would land on the ice, it would just eject. Mm-hmm. Like you would literally land and eject, <laughs> but those Burton bindings were sick. They like hooked the it air up. ones were dope. They were next level. Man. Yeah. And they look cool. They changed the game. The artwork much. was insane. Yeah, so I grew up with uh, a couple homies. We would shred. One of them was kids, Matt Sickles, that was a ride team manager. Oh, yeah, no, Sickles. My friend Clint, my friend Brian, primary crew. And we would, like, skip school, like, twice a week, go ride Sunday River or just cruise around. And, and uh, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, Maine was a good send-off point because you kind of learned to ride ice. But then, you know, growing up, you saw big mountains in the, you know, in the movies. And my first big move was to Colorado. I went to school in Fort Collins, but I 
really was like all about getting up to, to Summit County because at the time, Summit County was where all my heroes were living. It was like Nate Cole, Dale Rayberg, Russell Winfield, obviously all the old school heads from Vail, Adam Merriman, like all the dudes that I had in the magazines were living out there. So got out to Colorado. You were there at the time, and, I think. Yeah. Vail. What year did you move out there? I was up there. I moved there in 93, but I was in Colorado in 91. Nice. Going to school. And I moved there in 92. But when in, I went to 91 and I uh, – Really just wasn't, um, I knew I wanted to be a pro snowboarder. I remember being in high school and I had snowboarding on the front. You know, remember your old like folders? I don't know if you guys had the same, but in folders for school, they had this thing where you could slide a photo into the front. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I had a photo of Brushy in there doing like a Taipan. I know. And, uh, and I remember walking around people like, what is that? Like snow, there was like six snowboarders in Maine. You know what I mean? Yeah. um, And they're like, what is that? I'm like, that's what I'm going to do. For snow, I'm gonna you be a snowboarder, it. so I wasn't ballsy enough to just be like, I'm doing this. So I went to college for some reason. I should have just finished it. No, no, yeah, no. I actually had a good out from from college because I was living with this super super hippie dude, this kid Rob, and uh, he was a uh, selling weed, and um, he kind of back to the narc thing in Maine. You don't narc people out. Well, he was selling weed, but like some chick had bought weed off of us and uh, me, I guess technically. But so I got arrested, cuffed and stuff. I got a knock on the door, dorm room door at like 11 PM. And I'm like, come in. And the door swings open and there's six cops pointing guns at me. I'm sitting there in my dorm room and they're like cuff and stuff, bring me out. So that was my lucky exit from school. It was like the send off <laughs> point. Like, Thank God that she snitched on you. Oh, you got like great. literally kicked out of school. Yeah. So I was like, my parents, you know, I finished the semester, literally walk shame. Everybody on the fucking whole campus thought I was a narc. All the dudes, all my friends, quote unquote, were like, thought I was angling. But in May, because I never snitched, like, no, no one else ever got brought in. Yeah. So these people were like all terrified of me. And it was just a perfect time to like Get the really fuck out. do what the fuck I wanted. And, Went back and moved to Breck the next year. Yeah, I was going to say, That's, you weren't in Vail. You are in Breck, you, right? Yep. Yeah. We were talking last night, and, and at what point did you get a job with Solid Snowboards at their factory? Was that shortly after? Is that that was late. Yeah, okay. when I, I first moved to Breck, um, and I immediately got into, like, the typical move, which was, like, first of all, I moved to Breck. Trying to find a place to live there at the time was insane, as you probably know. So I was at Copper Mountain. I couldn't. That's why I moved to Vail. Yeah, it's insane. Couldn't find a place. Couldn't find a place. So I was riding Copper, and I was on the lift. I literally remember texting my mom, or called my mom on the payphone because it's pre-cell phone. And I was like, she's like, how are you? I'm like, mom. I was like almost crying, and she was crying because I was like, I got six bucks in my ATM. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm living in my car. Fucking. So that next day, I get on the lift of Copper, riding with these two kids, and they're like, hey, man, you're ripping. I'm like, you guys are sick, too. And they're going like, where do you live? Like, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, I don't have a place to live. And I got six bucks, so I might have to move out. And like the vibe at the time was like literally Summit County was like all snowboarders. If you went to the bar, it was 400 snowboarders. Yeah. And it was epic. But these dudes were like, come live with us. I moved in with Fair Play. They paid for every meal for like three months, just homies two kids from montana and then i eventually you were set up yeah and then i eventually found a job in in breck cleaning toilets on peak 10 and it was miserable like miserable cleaning toilets at night but shredding all day so it was the dream but also miserable but i knew there was an end to the means and then i ended up getting a job at uh island water sports next which was the coolest shop yeah so that was like dope because i met some people there um but i also like traded for everything like any mountain town it's all about the barter system. So, mm-hmm. like, people bring in their boards. I was the board tech. I would fix their board or wax your board for a six-pack or food. I never paid for weed, food, or beer or anything. And then I ended up working at Solid, too, which is sick. Working I didn't for know Solid. you worked there. That's sick. Yeah, I got a job. Uh, and, obviously, the Solid crew. This is a late. What You told me you were, like, 20. I was, 20. like, yeah, I was, like, 22 or so when I yeah. got the job at Solid. And it was the first time I didn't go back to Maine to work on the war. And I got a job there, and it was, like, you know, Kurt Westell, Jeff Westell, Matt Hale, Tuck was a team manager. Like, they, at the time, Breck was like, you know, like I said, almost all snowboarders. And you had Todd Richards, which was this, like, elite guy. And we can get into him a little later. But, like, and then you had the solid crew. It was, like, these wide, 
stance dudes and they would roll like deep like only solid dudes with solid dudes only fucking pipe jocks with pipe jocks and then like all the dirt bags tarquin would roll with his sister and like mm-hmm. a couple other heads but solid was like one of the dream that i boards were sick um so i got a job making their boards like laying up boards and uh so me and this kid tad worked our way up and it was cool because we worked there all summer um making boards and when we came in because you kind of had to like start off as a janitor and move up and like finally we got progressed to making boards and previous to us there was like two dudes that were like the best dudes that made snowboards and they were making like they would pay you per first quality Mm -hmm. so the best dudes ever had made like 10 first quality boards like in that was like the you know the peak yeah so me and my friend tab were like dude i was like let's fucking make some money here. Like, let's crush this. Let's come up with a process. You're going to, you're good at edges. Let's do the edges. I'll make the glue. I'll do this. You do this. And we ended up starting to make like 30 boards a day. Nice. Holy and shit. we were getting like checks every two weeks for like three grand, Damn. which was nuts. And yeah, they didn't, crazy. and they were such a shit show. They didn't figure it out for like three or four months. And eventually like I, Tad and I knew they were going to figure it out. We're like, all right, second they call us in the office to like tell us they're going to cut our pay. Like, we're done, right? He's like, yeah, we're done. So eventually we got the call in and they're like, the guy was like, hey, like you're making like double what the bosses are making. Yeah, like, you're making more than Neil <laughs> and all that. Yeah, we want to give you like 12 bucks an hour and me and Tao were like, we quit. Sorry, nice. thank you. But at the time, dude, it was sick because I was living on peak 10 with Spent yeah, and spent. Bree and Amy Bree, Wakefield. Dude. And we had a mini ramp in our basement. So every night I would come home with like two cases of Mickey's 40s get drunk every night, skateboard all night, every day, huge sessions. That's a dope. Oh, the life, like 30 dude. kids skating on an average night, like partying. It was. So at this point, are you, funding. you're riding the resort. Are you sponsored or are you no. like, so you're not even, so you're 22 yeah. and you're not even sponsored yeah, yet. Yeah. You're washed up at 22 now. I mean, <laughs> it, was you know I mean? Sick. it was sick. I mean, riding Breck, like you would go, it was such an amazing time. I mean, you know, cause like you would be, it was a tight, crew there was a veil crew of all like the pros that were kind of already made it like the ride dudes and some of the veil dudes and shit like j2 and all those guys meg and peach all those people yeah. over. and then you had some of the elite guys like brad or uh todd richards and some of those cats but then you had all the dirt bags but like everybody would know the day the breck pipe got cut and everybody would show up like yeah, everyone would roll frank what was his name frank wells cut all the wells. Frank wells. Yeah. Frank wells he would cut I all bet. the pipes and like everybody would know we'd catch the word up in vale yeah. and we'd all everybody would cruise over it'd be these yeah. insane sessions like so much fun but yeah i was I had no sponsors till i was like 23 i guess but i had my crew and we were filming stuff like out there crew like just like a bunch of like you know nobody's just filming our shit and one time we decided to hit i'd been eyeing this road jump up on i think it's peak nine at breck peak nine kicker or it's just different? this like concrete electrical box and then you air off this road into the super steep landing oh, I, remember, some trees. I remember this jump. yeah so we hit that and we filmed it and somehow mark mac dog was doing the 411 snow yeah at the time so he got a hold of the footage and it ended up being like the second or third shot in the opening but he called ride and he was like, hey, like all, you know, I think to speak frankly, most of the ride dudes were like over it, quote unquote. They were like done kind of shredding. It was kind of a turning point for a lot of things. And, uh, and Mac Dog called and was like, hey, who's this kid like that you sponsor? Cause he's riding a new board and I had just gotten a board from the rep. I bought it from, from like 200 bucks from like this guy, Brad Albert. And, uh, and I was filming on it. So Mac Dog called ride and they tracked me down. And I got a phone call one day from Ride. And they were like, hey, like, we got a call from Mac Dog. You're riding our shit. Like, who are you? Like, what are you up to? Do you want to, you know, maybe think about riding for us? And I was like, yeah, sure. And then, like, a week later, they put me in touch with Whitey. And Whitey called and was like, hey, I'm going to Alaska to film um, up at this camp, which is where I met Jesse Bertner for the first time Sick. and all these cats. And Devin Walsh was on the trip, so I was like, uh, of course. Yeah. <laughs> Dude, I mean, at the Absolute time, legend. there's two movies. I mean, you, there was TV4, which was yep. a different thing, but it was Dogger and Whitey. And, yeah. and Whitey calling me was just like, fuck, shocker. 
So I went to, to AK and filmed a video, my first part in Brown Trout, which was like Brown Trout was filmed dope. in like four days, and we got in a huge bar brawl fight and left the next. I mean, that fight was real. So yeah, it was Devin Walsh was on the trip. All the Canadians. I heard you kind of mixed it up in fights. Back I got then. a question. You look like somebody that could fuck somebody yeah. up in a fight. Yeah, I dude. used to hear stories. <laughs> like, yeah, of, <laughs> you were like really gnarly. I it, was pissed. When man. the time came to get pissed, you would like step up. I mean, I felt bad for anybody that happened the next day because, like, straight up, I had a childhood. Like, me and my brother are good now. Yeah. But my older brother, from the moment I was born till I was out of the house, systematic. Beat down. Beat down, <laughs> mental and physical. So Free like beat downs all day if long. People, mental and physical. <laughs> I mean, dude, I, I was not walked past without a smack in the head or like, you suck. Like, every day of my life. So <laughs> anybody that talks brother. shit Classic. to me, any time that, that snapped, it was like a blackout. Like, yeah. I mean, I remember being smashed over the head with bottles and just laughing at yeah, people. I'm like, that I've is heard the worst this. I've heard stories mistake like Mistake you just made right there. Well, so I would just snap and like, yeah, the, the AK one was brutal. I remember there was this guy talking shit to us. I mean, Canadians love to fight. That's just what they do. Yeah, they love to They don't fight. shoot each other. They fight. They shake hands at the end. Yeah. So these Alaskan dudes were at the bar talking shit. This one guy was at our table. And it was one of those tables that was sweet. It was like, it's in one mighty movie, but like the th tables that fold. And he was talking shit. So I was like, oh, yeah. Boom. Pushed him and all the drinks like slid onto this <laughs> guy. And he's like squirreling around, like trying to get him. <laughs> and we go outside with his crew and our crew. And it was like dealing. Probably shouldn't name names. But uh, anyway, it was brutal. People got fucked up. The next morning, we woke up at like five in the morning. We we're like, this place is beat. Let's, Let's get, get the out, out of here. <laughs> And apparently, a, like an hour after we left, like twenty dudes showed up with baseball bats. Like, oh. we are fucking lucky because Alaskans are crazy. They're too. crazy. Yeah. They're like every Alaskan I know is dope, but there's a switch. Yeah, and there's a little psycho killer. I mean, switch. it's all that dark. <laughs> it's all that dark. Yeah, that dark and just rugged land. And so fuck, man. Might need a bear when you're at the park and be ready, dude. So you almost got a baseball bat beat down. Yeah, man. And the fighting, down. the fighting Irish old. Graphic you had, yeah. It was like George Kleckner, man. Dude, it look it was so. You look like a kind of look like a boxer. I mean, I mean like, I, especially at the time, I'm I'm pretty skinny now, but at the time I was working the fishing wharfs in the summer you're still. Tough. So like, I mean, you go home. I was lifting like 150 pound crates and throwing them up like you know super high and like just the, tough. The saltiest of dogs, pretty much. Huh? I mean, fuck, dude. If you're like the one, the funnest thing about working on the fishing wharf was like when the salt truck showed up, cause there's these 80 pound salt bags that come on pallets and it's a hundred degrees. The new guy gets put in the salt shed, which is like 120 degrees. And like, you start this human line of like one guy takes it off the truck, throws it to the next guy who throws it to the next guy who throws it to the new guy in the fucking salt fucking shed. And like, that's just main style. Like it's like good natured hard work, but like, Salt bag would go from like five miles an hour to 20 miles an hour to like 50 miles an hour. And you'd literally turn around and the next one would be there. And that's the kind of shit that like makes you strong, like, and fun. And at the same time, like just a blast to fuck yeah, with people. The funnest thing is oh throwing these Sweet. giant salt bags. <laughs> Sorry, like like modern day, time. modern like day CrossFit time. now. Yeah. Actually. Yeah. I mean, I prefer people that. pay for that now. <laughs> I mean, straight up. Uh, so yeah. I might have got off, off topic there, but I don't no, know. I, I, That's a good fuck it, we topic. like getting off to topic, but I think it's cool for people to hear that you were 22, still working a job, no sponsors, yeah, and you fandangled your way into kingpin videos with Mikey, and like that, you know, a lot of times people might be like, oh, it's too late, I got to give up, but that that New England work ethic. Back then, it wasn't like that either. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I was think. late to the game for sure back then, but I remember there was a couple things that were motivational. I mean, one was. You know, there was an older guard that had already faded, and then there was this new school that had come in. It was like, the you know, the blunt mags had, like, brought up this, like, culture of, uh, like I mentioned before, a lot of the ride dudes, plus, like, you had Rowan Rogers and all that, all those early Mac Dog movies. And those dudes were, like, had a fast, hot run, and then they were, like, too cool, kind of. You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. good dudes, they're all homies. But, like, you know, I think they... It was people were making good money and it's easy to get lazy. And I was like, also, you know, one of the, I'm not saying I'm motivated by money, but like 
I knew that I was scrubbing fucking toilets and I knew these dudes were making money. I remember going, for example, bringing back up Todd Richards. I was with my friend Tony, who was an advocate, Tony Sabatella, um, super big advocate. He used to drive me all around and then kind of introduced me because I was so shy. Like, I wouldn't talk to a girl. Um, I wouldn't talk to anyone. People would be like, you want to be a pro snowboarder, don't you? I'd be like, no, no, I don't know. So I, had, I relied on everybody to talk for me. So Tony was this dude... I talked for him. I remember one time he, he was like, do you want to go to Todd's house? I'm like, yeah, let's go. I'm, I'm terrified. I meet Todd yeah. Richards. I'm like, eh. And he's like, Mike, come over here. And he's, he's like the kind of guy, like, he's hilarious. He was like always snooping around in people's shit. So he walks me over to Todd Richards' desk. And he's like, points at this envelope. He's like, lift, turn that over. Turn it over, and it's a check from Moro Snowboards for two hundred sixty plus thousand dollars. Come on, two hundred sixty racks and cheddar, it, cheddar biscuit. Wow, ring. yeah. Woo. And I'm like, my eyes were just like two hundred sixty k. And that was just the board royalty. That was royalty for like a quarter or something. Holy shit, sh- that's some bisque. Is he getting royalties on that spoon thing? Was that his? It's, I don't even. I know. mean, he was one of the top dudes for yeah. sure, and he was. At the time, Terrier's main competition. Yeah. Which must have been fucking depressing because Terrier was like undefeated for like six years or something. True, shit. huh? That's a lot of chatter, But that was though. a motivational tool. And like, Fuck yeah. I remember like getting my first like $200 paycheck from Ride and being like, this is the shit. 200 bucks a month, dude. Like, wow, mm. I've made it. But at the same time, you know, yeah, I'm fucking all those years of like scrubbing toilets dead fish like when you see number one the dream i've been after and wanting to do it but like the potential of things opening up because once your video part drops you start to make these connections and people are coming around and they're hitting you up peter line left d23 and had an opportunity there and i'm like ooh, this is like so you know things start to happen yeah, you rode for d23 right yeah and i think plus getting a, a later start kind of gave me like i was like uh i mean i watched entire movies in slow motion like straight up like slow. i was a student of the game like i had watched every magazine every video but there were certain movies that came out like definitely subject talk is number one favorite movie watching that whole part watching ingmar backman's part in substance like literally entire video parts strapped in on the living room for in slow motion learning tricks is that paperback writer yeah yeah oh, dude Best song. You think I see? I'm not. I do know some video part songs. Bud's throwing us for a loop. He knows. It's got to you know, it's gotta just be the right era, dude. dude. I mean, when I was a student of the game. Yeah, I mean, so watching all these people come and go, like guys younger than me. Technically, Devin Walsh was my hero, but he's a couple years younger than me. He was my hero for five or six years before I got to meet him. You know, um, but like seeing the come and go and how people kind of ran their careers too was cool too because once i got into the game i knew hey i don't want to be the guy who's at burton with like head to toe on everything because they control you and i've always believed in like i saw like the universe you could create through multiple sponsorships and i just knew i wanted to do some of those things coming in and so maybe getting ahead of myself there but like not smart though because stevie alters you get the rug pulled out everything's yep. gone you don't even know what to do yep good call dude see that's a good um, technique but, uh, yeah, Ride was my first sponsor. I had a, I mean, that was the coolest brand. To me, like, there was, like, Joyride had, was probably my favorite, but it got, had already gone away. Yeah. So Ride at the time was, like, the dream. So to get a call from Ride was, like, fucked. Because they were, like, pushing the best riders, some of the best product. They had baseless bindings. Their they ads had, and shit. Their ad campaigns were insane. Um, but, yeah, I got on Ride and st- stuck around for, like, a year and a half. And then Peter Line left D23 to start Forum, I think, mm. around then. And I remember getting a call from the dudes at D23, and they're like, hey, we're looking for a replacement for Peter Line, and we think you could be it. And I was like, first of all, there's <laughs> no fucking replacing Peter Line. <laughs> yeah. He is like the inventor Peter Line. of most tricks, and he's a fucking genius. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, how much do you want to pay me? <laughs> And it was like ten you're all, times. Like you're like, I've seen this one check on Todd Rich's desk. I mean, let's talk about the bisque. Come I mean, I can... went from like I was an offer two hundred a month. To... It was two hundred a month for like boards, bindings, and everything. To here's two hundred, two or twenty five hundred a month plus board royals tees for just snowboards from D twenty three. And I was like, I don't know. Let me think about it because I knew Ride was kind of in between, and they were talking about. So I hit up my team manager Jack Coglin, and I was like, Hey, dude, like. 
got this offer. I obviously want to be honest and stay true. And he was like, dude, you're like, no, like we, you can get two fifty a month and, and that's where you're at. And I was like, well, that's what he said. I mean, he wasn't being a dick. He was like, he's just like, that's I, I know it. I've been budgets a team manager. Are budgets, yeah. And I was like, well, dude, I'm like, I like straight up my pitch at the time was like, look, if you open a magazine right now, I'm get, I've got like, if you just do the figures, I'm not saying I have a bigger name than these dudes, but I'm getting twice the coverage and the only one filming video parts, really. Pat A and Chad were actually still snack. We're still making their own videos, which are sick. Um, we're sick. Yeah, Pat A is. But all those dudes dope. were, all, the rest were done. And I was like, I'm getting all the coverage. And it was cool. Like, I really, thinking back, I'm s- all those little, like, moments of, like, jumping off, to me, it's like... Uh, Number one, it's personal empowerment. Number two, whenever you get, whenever I really think about getting started, and I, you know, I mentor some riders. I have less lately, but over the years, there's been a few. And I've seen this happen time and time again. But like, you start with a company, and you, everybody gets used to a certain thing, and you could be crushing it. And all of a sudden, it's like, you know, it's kind of like, it's so rare you hear about the janitor that raises up to be the CEO. True. You usually have to leave and come back. Yeah, you got to leave till you're valuable. Yeah. So I could, I did go back to ride like 10 years later, and it was sick. From a strong point. You feel yeah. like you were like reinvented yourself when you went back and were worth way more because of that? Honestly, I mean, man, I think when I got back on ride, I was almost washed up. So I was like, <laughs> I mean, I still had a couple good years left. Yeah. But it was just a good fit. The timing had changed. The the, the people had changed completely. Like Max Matt Sickles well, was okay. now the team manager. Mm-hmm. There was an, another guy. Um, some of the engineering crew was there, but the heads of running the show, you know. Also, the way you leave a brand is super important because, like, I came back to people that had left with a good taste in their mouth, yeah. and you remained friends over the years. And you know, they were looking at the time. For, I think Brushy was up again, kind of someone to come in and kind of be the leader of the team, maybe mentor some people was the original concept, but I was in per se. Yeah. But at the time I was like, well, you know, honestly at the time I had my shit going, I was making movies. I didn't really, wasn't super interested in the guys on the team. I was like, let me just do my thing. And I had earned that over 10 years of like, Hey, like, cause there's riders that come in and it's like, they need that like position, like of the team manager to be like, here's your whole life set up in front of you. And I was like, fuck that. Like my life is, I'm setting it up. You help me pay for it. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? And there's different type of people, you know, and some people need it. Well, that's what I was doing. Do their own thing. Yeah. When you started shooting with Whitey. Yeah. So were you guys instant buds or like, how did that whole process develop? Cause I know he's an interesting guy. He's kind of yeah. quirky and yeah. I mean the first trip you became like crew, you know? Yeah. I mean, it was cool. I mean, I think at the time it's all kind of back to that kind of changing of the guard. Like Whitey was living in Vail when I met him Yeah, and we filmed together for that first year. And I think he was just like, dude, it's time for a change. Like there's a new guard. There has to be a new guard. Cause like he was shooting with some legit dudes that remained in the crew, like J two and all those guys, Ali Goulet, but he was also filming with a bunch of people that would like, he would wake up every morning and cut, call him at eight in the morning. Like, what are we doing today? And like, no one would answer. They all party. And I was a dude answering. He's like, Hey, and finally he was like, Hey, like, what do you think about moving to Utah? Ah. Like a year after meeting him. I was like, yeah, those look, those mountains look real. I'd never been here. And uh ride actually set up a team house too mm. here, which was cool for all the AMs. So I moved in with Brandon Ruff the first year. Whitey moved out here. So, yeah, I mean, moving with, like, hanging with Whitey and moving with him out here and meeting JP and all those dudes eventually. Yeah, because that's when Whitey's true, crew kind of yeah. changed to, like, a crazy crew. Whitey's crew changed, my crew changed. Like, and I think, you know, coming out here was an eye-opener to Salt Lake, too, because, like, you went from park, essentially, to, like, mountains and backcountry and handrails. Yeah which was like also kind of the next step for me, but also Whitey was like, I think for Whitey it was cool. And when we moved in together, it was super cool. Cause like we both played, we're like, we both play music. He's a guitarist. I played bass, Cody Dresser and blue. Both were our drummers. They lived with us at different points. Sick. Um, blue from Capita. So like moving in with Whitey, I mean, he's a creature of habit. Like that dude is like regimented, like, he wakes up every day at the same time. He works out every day, comes home and eats the same exact sandwich, eats the same yogurt with his finger, every tame in the car. Like, you got to get used to some quirks. 
he's definitely OCD <laughs> as fuck. But at the same time, like, I mean, Whitey was a huge uh, teacher for me, like, about, like, number one, how to make a project, put it together a single handle. He had some great filmers, but, like, the dude was, like, from music to editing to team to organizing to money, the whole thing, one-man show. He hired filmers, but the other thing he did was, like, constantly put his own, like, everything into it, which I think was cool because he took a risk financially, like, constantly. Even to this day, like, the dude makes fucking music videos for homies that they have a $2,000 budget and he'll spend his own money to make it and then he'll make a Nike commercial for a million dollars or whatever. Damn. But, like, he's, like, always put everything in and I, I think I fucking learned so much from him about, like, how to, like, no matter what, like... And he was like, he oh, for an OC dude, C dude, he's probably the most creative dude too. Like mm-hmm. all those weird commercials he made and like yeah. the weird like skits with like Timmy. You talked about Timmy's officer skit, like the skits we did in New York, like buying and just the loose. For Destroyer, those ones are so good when you're the. We bought the bus and got and this dude yeah. to drive it around like yeah. we didn't even know. And like just like. I know you've been smoking that wacky weed, boy. Now get the hell out. <laughs> that's yeah. Mikey's quote. <laughs> yeah, man. But around that time, that's yeah. really cool to hear because. At a certain point with with um, Kingpin, you switched over to M3, which I want to talk about. Yeah, yeah. But for me as a kid, I had I bought the M3 Sidewall series, mm-hmm. your board, mm-hmm. and I was a I was a huge fan, you know, growing up. And I think a lot of that has to do almost what you said with with Whitey, where you could watch your snowboarding and you could see your all work ethic, and you put everything you had into it like you charged it and you just you can tell there's dudes it's just natural and there's dudes that some dudes are more like a i won't say you're more like a bulldog where you're like i'm just gonna fucking Mm -hmm. like do it and i i was drawn to that because i it didn't come naturally for me as much where i felt like i was more work ethic and i don't know it's just weird how you can almost see that in somebody's snowboarding i thought that was cool you know i would say 90 out of 100 pro snowboarders that i see you know like maybe 30% of them have like the natural talent and 70 are like hard workers that make it. Mm -hmm. I was definitely in the hard worker thing. Um, I mean, I had a vision that was all encompassing and blinding. Like I would write down my video parts and the tricks and they were aspirational and I would get like, you know, half of them, you know, a season, but like Anytime I dropped in, like, it was 50-50 or less of a chance of landing it. Because I'd be out with, like, Jeremy or JP. And, like, a lot of times those dudes would call an FT and be like, get it first try. It wasn't depressing. I just knew I was going to battle. Like, 99% of the time I was going to do it, like, after, like, five or six or ten tries. And at the same time, I don't know. I think, you know, I watched a lot of kids with all the natural talent that didn't have to work for it. And as we know, that's just a common story. Like you just don't, you take it for granted. Yeah. You know? So like, and there's other ones that like, there, sorry, yeah, yeah, there, there's a very rare, there's a very rare collision of natural talent and work ethic. Yeah. That's where you get like a Bodie or yeah, like dude. probably, mm. a, I'm guessing like Travis Rice. I don't know him or somebody Bodie, like that. Bodie, Travis yeah, Rice, or, totally. Giggy yeah. probably. Yeah. Because yeah. Giggy's another good and example. And it is very rare, huh? To have yeah. it all. Yeah. Some of those natural talented guys are really like they're kind of late. Let's lazy for lack of a better yeah. word, I guess. Yeah, very few. I mean, they're you just see so it. good. They're just like, yeah, whatever. Totally. I think yeah. there's guys that like. I think that yeah, there has to be a third element, and I think the natural talent with the drive is super key. Like I, you see it with like a Terrier, who's like I think his third element might be like com- competition, mm-hmm. um, and then I, like a Travis Rice, it's like just doing the most epic. Devin Walsh, it's like community i think like he's just in one you know level for him like creating like something fucking cool like i think he grew up in skateboarding so hard that he just wanted his crew around and that kept him moving and yeah so that's always another thing that i think like for me working hard um just part of what i was um but also i just like watched like i love the video part like for me i hated contests never liked contests never was into contests, got mad respect for dudes that can put themselves through that. But if someone's telling me when to go and what to do, no way. 
fuck that. Yeah. Like, I want to be with the people I want to be with. I want to do the trick. I want to do it with. Um, and I think like, you know, having the vision for the video part and how that's, I was also a musician. I am a musician. So like, I always loved watching a video part where, you know, you can ruin a good video part with a good song. So, you know, three quarters of the year in, I would have like two or three songs and I started envisioning even the songs that were going to, where that part's going to hit with this trick, with the song, how's it, how's the emotion going to be built? Cause I was brought up on skateboarding and, you know, during my heyday of shredding, like I never watched, I stopped watching video parts probably after like TB4 cause I wanted, I only watched skateboarding. Like my, the number one video part I would say and he's not my favorite skateboarder, but the number one video part that drove my vision on how to put together a video part was Jamie Thomas and Zero. Oh, yeah. I mean, dude, like the one one more on the 5-0 down the hammer. Like just the – he knew how to like have great music, build the emotion, but also he knew how to like put a little bit of like uh, drama into it, which is cool. I don't, I'm not saying I ever hit that point, but like that – whole video part was more important than any of the tricks. You know what I mean? It was like, how do you put that out There's and make it strong? It's so cool. The two perspectives. Cause you have, you have like, com- like, you know, competitive snowboarding, which is people that are athletes that, that like to compete in yeah. competitive drive. And you see a lot of the video part people, it comes from this creative side of their brain, a lot yeah. of musicians or artists, mm-hmm. cause you're creating something. And essentially the ones I, I think kids get lost in that what I'm hearing from you is kids get lost in the tricks and they think it's about this trick, this trick, this trick yep. when it's about creating a feeling, feeling. And creating in the song and yep. whether, whether it's a, you know, feeling associated with listening to rap or yep. whatever it is, yep. it's, it has, you got to feel something. Yep. Right. And that's yeah, you got to create the feeling. You got to create diversity. I mean, I also remember living with Whitey and we would get back the 16 mil footage. Nowadays you're like getting back the digi and you're like, ah, 10 seconds later, did I, did I get that? But back in the day, we're shooting 16, and I was like, you'd be on, you, your crew better be one down for you. Because if they're competing with you and you're like, hey, did I get that? They're like, oh, yeah, you got it. Yeah, that. they say yes, even though you And there was that, that went down. <laughs> I see yeah. that happen a lot. But actually. like, so I formed strong relationships with, there were certain dudes that I trusted, like J2. Did yeah. I, I would trust J2 like half the time. Ali, Ali, I would choose maybe wants to get out of there. I would trust Ali Goulet for telling me I wouldn't trust anybody else to send me off a cliff than Ali because everybody would be like, I'm going to send you out there and you get hurt. But when it came down to like tricks, I would trust no one other than like back in the day with Jeremy and JP because it was like we made a pact straight up like a blood pact. Like if I don't like you tell me yeah. if it's one percent question. Because you were waiting two months to get this footage back, dude. Like, you ain't going back. Yeah. So, like, did I fucking get that? Be harsh. And it hurt your feelings, but you knew you had to get the fuck back up there and do it right or not. Um, so, like, that was super, super cool. And, like, just getting that, like, quality was, like, super important. So, I remember getting the raw footage back a couple times with Whitey. And at the end of the year, we'd go into the editing room and certain people would be on the phone be like, where's my part? We you sent me a twenty second part. He's like, yeah, you dude, you filmed twenty seven backside one eighties. Like that's real. I'm not making that yeah. up. Yeah, Bobby Meeks. That's um, <laughs> sorry, Bobby. Wow. Dang, Meeks. He had good. I mean, Bobby Meeks could do any trick in the world. Yeah. But I remember specifically this one year he was bummed, and I was like, fuck, dude. You got the back 180 down, but you should have done one of those cork back fives. So like, yeah, he's got his, such good. His back, back fives. fives were like some of the best. Yeah. He and just, I mean, dude, everything. He was a bear kid. He like he just good. had that trick. The switch lock, front flips huh? too. I dude, like. he could front flip off anything. Yeah, that's I love awesome. you, Bobby. I'm not trying to throw you. all love you, Meeks. We skipped over something earlier when you were talking about how you don't want to be told when to go, what to do, contests, all that. Yeah. Um, and then you told the story about your dad last. Yeah, night, yeah. And that almost ties in. Totally. Yeah. I mean, I think like part of my my youth was obviously. I developed a uh, anti-authority thing pretty early. Like growing up in Maine with a dickhead brother, uh, my parents were like, well, fuck, you're not going to protect me. Cool. Fuck you. I'm going to do what I want. I literally got my first job at 10. Didn't let my parents 10. buy one piece of clothing for me since then after that. Wow. Um, I was like, I'm buying my first car. I'm buying my shit, my snowboards, everything. Um, not that I didn't try. They'd be like, do you want new hawk skates? I'm like, nope. Use my brother's old ones. 
You know, so I just kind of developed that. And then I got into skateboarding, which got me into punk rock, which was obviously like the fuck you thing. And and then, you know, playing the punk rock shows and scenes and then uh, and then like getting into like, you know, the contest thing. I remember being at the f- a couple like early on. And it's like this. There'd be a guy up there with like headphones on. It's like, you know, it's just the scene and no disrespect the people that do it. I got mad respect because it is hard. But, like, I remember being up there and be like, okay, you, you're go now. And you're like, ah, oh, no, man. I'm not re- I don't feel this. Like, I have to get hyped. I got to get ready. I got to feel it. I, there, I have, like, you know, when I was really in it, I also had, like, certain things I wanted to do. Like, I ha- during my peak, if I didn't have uh, on a big jump day, for example, like, I had to have a, a giant size of peanut M&M's. And I had to eat the whole package before I dropped in for the first try. And I also had to, like, knock on my board a certain amount of times every time before, like, I dropped in. So you couldn't do that at a contest. None of that was cool. Like, it, it just takes a, took away all my, like, control, which I didn't like. Yeah. And, like, if I'm filming, like, I also was never there to, like, shoot the filler. You know what I mean? Like, I'm going to, like, filler happened at the end of the year. Like, first try off a jump, I'm going to go for the Switch 7 or whatever. Like, anything hard. Get it out of the way. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, a lot of those, a lot of the clips, knowing Brighton very well, this is going to be super niche, but the MFM jump way yep. up in the cooler, that yep. thing gets flat later in the year. Yep. So I know you filmed a lot of those yep. switchback sevens yep. early and stuff, particularly. Yep. Yeah, it's funny you mentioned that trick because I'm thinking of that trick. Yeah. Because that board I was riding was huge and miserable. <laughs> like a huge M3 that was like as stiff as a piece of yeah. metal. <laughs> um, when I left M3, it was, Literally, just sidetrack real quick. Let's do it. I remember riding the M3 boards in Mad Love because Andy Wright was the graphic designer. I don't know if anybody knows that. I didn't Did know not. that. He Damn. designed all the ads, all the boards, all the whole thing. But Blaze and Chad were a huge part of that, and then St- Scotty Whitlake. But, like, the boards, after I got back on to ride from M3, I realized I had been at, like, a 30% handicap. Disadvantage. <laughs> Those boards sucked <laughs> so bad. 30%. Uh, they were yeah. miserable. I got on the ride boards to these urethane silos. I'm like, this is a game changing event. But anyway, yeah, the, the, like to me, like I learned that. I think that's another thing about changing of the old guards. I remember going out with the old dudes on days where it'd be like, all right, I'm just going to warm up YD with like a back three. <laughs> and I was with JP and Jeremy and they're like, I'm going for switch seven. I was like, that's the route. Like, Jeremy, I remember, was probably the first dude I remember seeing in this, really. Uh, I'm sure guys like Kevin Jones were doing this, too, but, like, I wasn't with those dudes. But, like, I remember going out initially with these older kind of dudes. Like, I'm going to warm up for the back three, Whitey. Uh, Is that good? Cool. I'm going to go home. Uh, But, like, I want to get the new (laughs) shit. And I watched roll up to a jump with these new kids in Utah. And JP's front five and off cliffs to fakie in three feet of pow. And Jeremy's like cab nining first try. And I'm like, oh, I got to like, I'm in between here. Yeah. Like these dudes are fucking doing this. Like I need to like do that. So like I started just going for the hard shit first. You know what I mean? So like that's because why not? I mean, I'd rather have like 20 good shots because also dissecting the video parts before was like, do you want 20 good shots or do you want, 20 shots with the jazz music and Dogger's movie, which means you got the shitty C part. In the middle of the movie. Which I was in a couple times. Fuck you, Mac Doc. (laughs) Fucking dick. Love the call out. I love you, but... (laughs) I love the call out. I love you, but I hated that jazz part, man. I like the motivation of just chucking ass that you're talking about, too. Just get out there and just fucking... Make it happen. Well, I guess the other thing about that, too, is, like, I hate park. So, like, I never liked park miserable icy shitty fuck park yeah i loved it when i was a kid because it's like cool like when i lived in brick um but like powder wow okay like, and then but you only have x amount of powder days so if you don't practice in the park and landings well i never practice in the park and yeah. i will say that for sure i've only done anything over a 720 or 720 and up in powder maybe a couple park jumps but like any 900 i ever did is in a video part. Like, I never, ever did one for fun. Nice. It was only for video. And probably 80% of any 540 or 720, only in a video part, only because I wanted it in my video part. And I, 
you know, I think it's well said. What, who said it? J2? Anything over a 360 is repeating yourself? Yep. I don't know if it was J2. <laughs> I think that was a J2. Probably yeah. someone, but maybe Russell kind of coined that. I think, too. We'll have to get our fact checker on we'll that. we have to get a fact, fact checker. Check. Fact check. But anyway, dude, like, chuck your mar- chuck your carcass. Go hard. Like, dream up tricks. Land on your head. Now they're doing Eat it. shit. Jesus. Yeah. Well, the thing they're too doing all sorts of shit. It's it's like one one banger, one crazy <laughs> trick in your video part is worth like fifteen fillers. You only need one trick, yeah, for the year if it's a fucking if it's that good, huh? If it's an ender, yeah, that's, Dude, that's it. sick. Yeah. I don't know if this is true, and this is kind of backtracking, but Andy Wright seems to think you were in a Pepsi free ad. I was, yeah, man, but I was kid, a kid. Yeah, as a kid. And he did, was wondering if that maybe uh, got you excited about being in front of a camera. Or I mean, it definitely taught me that I, when I was six years old that I could make. Was when you were six, could make five grand being you on made TV. Five G's at six. Five G, man. How did this come about? Someone just some bisque. That's model good bisque for that. Random age. casting, hundred bucks cash for anybody that showed up. They filmed in us. Maine. Yeah, I was like these Pepsi free commercial. You can find it on YouTube, and uh, it's on YouTube. I've seen it. Yeah. Oh, I'm definitely gonna find that. In yeah, there too. and I'm just <laughs> at the table for yeah. literally half a second, going like this. Yeah, and I got five G's. It was like Wait, going like what? <laughs> it was like a hundred. Star was born. I think I got like two hundred <laughs> bucks faces per <laughs> per commercial, dude. Like you get paid per roll. I was in SAG. Like you're getting checks, like, dude. It was sick. Just showing up to the house. So you're a child star, dude. I guess some Andy, proper bisque. And you threw that at me last night, yeah. and I was like, wow. Dude. That definitely was like. I mean, I don't think it motivated me that much, but, but it was probably it was cool. fucking nice. Yeah, going going back to the snowboarding, the thing I admire that's rare nowadays. Yeah. Snowboarding's become very like compartmentalized. You have your half pipe guy yeah. that does your half pipe. You <laughs> have your rail guy that only hits rails and street, and it's not crossover, right? And so I, you look at your old video parts. It's like you got a cab seven in the half pipe. You got a front nine on a jump. You got a bunch of handrail tricks. You're all in off shit. Like, what was the the thought process on that? Um, Is that just what you guys did? Yeah, I mean, I think I was maybe at a time where that was a little more common. Yeah. Especially in the Whitey movies. But, like, I think I just liked all of it, you know? I liked all of the – I love hitting jumps. I love half pipe. And I love rails. So, like, why not? Um but I think, you know, even at the time, there was pipe dudes, there was rail dudes, there was, um, I just was stoked on it. I mean, I just liked it. I mean, no yeah. other thing to say than that. I love when just, there was a fresh cut pipe. That's, I loved going there and seeing what those freaks would do and trying to, like, keep up. Yeah, just know? hiking and getting. Yeah, and also I just kind of felt like at the time, it'd be my video part just wanted to be real, well-rounded. I wanted to have, like, current shit in everything if I could, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Just thought it was cool. Well, there was something you said um, basically like when we were talking last night about how you always do the – your what people are doing, you always do the opposite in yeah. some ways. That was your mentality for – I feel like when, especially when you get into your kids' no video parts mm-hmm. um, where everybody's out there sliding rails and you're just like flying off of stuff. In, like nobody was ollieing stairs or hitting gaps. Yeah. You know it, and that's that's always kind of cool too. Yeah, like you kind of created the air jumps to flat. Well, and, I yeah. mean, not I mean, it's skateboarding. Yeah, but yeah. You brought it to snowboarding. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that was Benny actually said you had an interesting theory on landings that he kind of used throughout his career. If you had to build a landing, yep. you shouldn't jump it. Yeah, I mean, I mean, that was kind of came pregame from handrails because, like, I remember Joel Mahaffey and I used to kick it, and we would like watch certain railers video parts like there would be like the rail guy that would show up literally with like a 21 18 stance with goggles on <laughs> and like full regalia of like a bag back country or not yeah. even back country, just like a technical a mount order. rider at the rail yeah and they would build a fucking kicker like one inch below the rail t- top and we're like dude you don't skate you don't even look like you skate you look like you're snowboarding on this rail, but we were skating every summer, like all summer. And like, we want to fucking Ollie from flat onto this rail. I think I got lazier later on, but like, it was always like an inch was the max. And if you couldn't get on the rail from there, fuck you. Like you're not, then don't doing, hit it. Don't even show up. So we were always kind of at like clowning dudes like that. But also I think 
if you want to stand out, no matter what you're doing, I did this with snowboarding, but also with clothing choices in snowboarding with Holden as well, like doing Holden. If you look at your little world, it's, you're just going to be doing what everybody else is doing. It's Copying there's no people. difference. Yeah. Maybe, maybe you're just inspired by that, but like the world is big. Like I never watched snowboard parts because I didn't want to like, I wanted to be inspired by something number one that I love, but something that was outside of. So you could bring freshness to it. And the Ollie's was definitely inspired by skateboarding. And, but like, you know, with clothing too, it's like, you know, why do I have to wear my goggles with a, on a handrail? I think I w did do that until I figured it out. You know what I mean? But like, let's just wear what you want, feel comfortable, do something different. And I think there's a lot more of that now maybe, but we're and currently to the point. Well, it all, it shows when you put a lot of thought into your whole video part and yeah. You know, you were saying how you used to match your kit to the spot, like yeah, yeah. stuff like that. For you know? sure, dude. Yeah, I think a lot of people used to do that because photographers dude. liked it too, and I it mean, just looked cool. It's dude, like you're creating art. Totally. I mean, I think like I always ran like I knew I had a couple of photographers that I really shot with. We shot with a couple times, but main, my main dudes were Whitey Andy. and Andy. Yeah, and uh, shouts to Andy he gets an air horn. Shouts to Andy. I live with Andy too, so it was yeah. like. You know, I would, would go look at a spot and be like, all right, it's mostly concrete here. Like, there's this gray rail, and it's, like, a lot of gray tones. Like, pink sweater. Duh. Like, let's pop this shit out. Like, or the cover of a that Andy shot at Transworld, it was going to be fall. I was waiting for the first snowstorm, and I knew, like, gold is going to stand out here. Like, let's do this. Like, cause, and, like, even if you look at how they, like, put the color together, they brought in those tones. So, like, yeah, like. I would always shop from my spots if I could, even if I was on a trip to like Montreal, which is hands down the best place to go on a rail trip. As you know, Stoney, <laughs> we've been on some good. Ones, oh my so. God. <laughs> um, dude, I would always find my spots and then hit the thrift store and match it up. Cause like it just totally makes a difference. So I yes. think so too. They really stand yeah. out. Well, huh? yeah. And then going back to Andy, when you shoot with him, you pull up in a black hoodie or something. And he just He's like, bombed. No, he was. Do you have anything blacker than that? Like, <laughs> totally, so bummed. Totally. He actually probably helped train me because he used to bitch about other people, but I heard it, man. You know, like, I heard it's like, you know, you don't always, just because your sponsor sent you an all black kit doesn't mean you have to wear it. You all the I mean? time. Yeah. You can rock thrift store coat. I was, I've been told that the key to photography is light and and black kind of uh it's absorbs not, it absorbs it, absorbs it. it's yeah. not it's not very conducive it just to the sucks light your flashlight in you yeah. can't even tell there's it, all, it sometimes. sucks your flashlight in as your well too totally it's sucked in i mean it's cool I, I mean i think that was the other cool thing like finding my people like andy wright and whitey and you had your crew i had my crew but also you get to that point eventually when you work together with someone so much and even with filming, like a lot of times we filmed ourselves, but with Shelby or with Whitey or Jeremy and JP filmed, we filmed each other a lot. It's like we watched skating. We knew how you should film a front board on a handrail, but like everybody brings their two cents of artistic vision to it. And so it ends up being the best. And if you just show up and like rely on, even if it is Andy, it's like, hey, dude, like, fuck you. You're blowing it. Like, move. Yeah, say something. I'm doing something else. You're being lazy. Move over there because I'm going to do a different thing than this dude. And so, he wants to know that. Too, and I'll be know? like, this is what I want it to look like. And he would, you know, half times be like, no, no, like this, um, the light's here. It's going to look dope. And you form that trust. Yeah. But it takes years. And, like, I think just putting in that time and building those relationships, like, made for magic happen. And so, lots 100%. of it happened. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, man. And for the people that don't know, you had a production company at some point. You started called Kids Know, <laughs> which had yeah. two of the cult classic, maybe <laughs> best videos. Some people would say best videos ever, Love, Hate, and Burning Bridges. And at the time, the climate was, you know, Mac Dog, Standard, Absinthe. But there wasn't that, like, from my understanding, cool, like, <laughs> Whatever, <laughs> cool video. I don't know what the fuck you call it, but yeah, I mean, I think, I think that was like taking candy from babies. It was so easy because like the hard part was getting the money, but the easy part was like, all right, dude, like here's a formula. With I love all those brands you just mentioned. Then there's still a couple like Apps and still crushes, but like they have a formula, and the formula was all the same within like ten percent, and like our 
the one thing we were going to bring, which was the 50% that was the same, was going to be the snowboarding, but the element of skate. Like, it's just like, dude, we're going to make a skate video. We're going to shoot it. Everybody was on film. We're going to shoot this all digital. It's going to be VX2000. It's going to be these cameras with long lenses. So it's going to be a skate video, but we're going to show, like, my, I had seen this kid, Shelby Menzel, who was literally, like, the first kid I ever saw wearing tight pants, jeans. Now he dresses like an 80-year-old grandpa. Is that how he dresses? But, like, <laughs> dude, I saw his skate videos at Milo, and I go into these Milo skate premieres, and, I, and the, there was, like, something there. I was like, there is something so different, because not only did he nail the, the raw skate, but he had this sense of humor of the smoking and the fucking around and the in-between moments, which I think I had learned by that time in my career, I could film a sick video part, at least good. But at the premieres and two years, three years after a video part, the only thing people came up to me and talked about was, it was never a trick. It's like, hey, dude, that time you were funny, or hey, that time you fucking pulled your pants up, or this time you threw the meat over your shoulder. So I learned, like, quickly. <laughs> the meat over the shoulder is a good one. <laughs> so I learned. I was like, the personality yeah. is longevity. You used to make funny faces. I and, still do. But yeah, like, we need to get some of Dude, these. longevity Mike, is. Mike Striker, wasn't that one of your I mean, characters? that was endless characters, dude. <laughs> I mean, we can go there. But. You used to go on film and pretend you're drinking out of puddles. That one always got me. <laughs> I it, love it that. It would always leak, but it looked like it was real. I love that. It looks one. like he's drinking out of the gutter in the corner. It's a just... great move. <laughs> I love like, doing what's that. What's this guy doing? We're going to sidetrack because I love doing that. <laughs> yeah, I still do it to my like 11-year-old kid, and he hates it. Really? But like the best time I ever did it was in New York, like up like – Lower East Side after a rainstorm. Water. The water's like black with oil shit and like all these dudes in suits. And I'm with my friend Amy, J2's ex. Yeah. Oh, Amy. Gunther. And Gunther and fucking, I'm like, Amy, wait a second. Let's check. The, and I kneel down by this puddle and I'm like, and you reach, what the key is, you reach down and you like leave a little like room between your fingers, but you're like, I've tried to do it. I can never nail it. Like, <laughs> and people like literally like spread like they like they like COVID it around. Yeah, me, do, like, a couple, do a couple more. Examples. He's like kneeling he's like, down yeah. too in the puddle. Got, his face, his yeah, facial his expressions face. are out of he control for the listeners. The so you get down on one knee. <laughs> yeah, one. You gotta knee. be like, can they see me? Yeah, they, they you gotta be not behind it. the mic. So yeah. So like, yeah, you get down on one knee, and essentially you're like, you gotta like make a production, like do a little stretch. Like you're fucking pretend you pretend you're in the middle of the city, but you got to pretend that you're like in the middle of nature in a pristine environment. And there's a fresh <laughs> pool of like stream running by and it's like, and you just got to pretend like, and then just, <laughs> <laughs> and then like, and then people just explode around there. They're disgusted. It looks just, so real. When it's he does it. sweet. <laughs> So that's one of my favorite movies. We that's talk, that's one of my we, favorite movies you do. This thing that made me laugh so hard still to this day was is the triple back skit. Oh, and it's fuck. Like the, 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 he's like, the triple back. Yeah, I was a god that day. That was, is that yeah. that one? And you like, basically, what, what? can you tell the story behind you winging a triple back on a cornice? Yes. So hip of love, I think. Uh, yeah, or the, no, the Valley of the Cornices. Yeah, Valley yeah, of the I mean, like, okay. <laughs> I mean, fuck, everybody knows what, maybe not everybody, but it's a slog to get the fuck up there in spring. You're slogging up there, you build this thing, you're packing 80-pound bags of salt, and it doesn't work. So you spend like six hours building this shit, you're exhausted, so tired. <laughs> and I don't know, when I get exhausted and tired, I basically my fuck it comes out strong. <laughs> I'm just like, fuck it. And I get, I'm a napper too. Like I, I could fall asleep at any time. So I think this triple back, I'd probably gotten exhausted probably falling asleep in the 90 degree sun and woken up super pissed that the shit wasn't working so i'm just like why do you fucking film this and just you know when you're so pissed and you're just like it's not gonna work so you're just gonna like fuck it i'm just gonna send it and hopefully i snap my neck so i never have to do this again so i just fucking sent it and went rah, rah. and i think i'd went for that like four or five times just to like I wasn't planning on landing that. It was just going to be like... Like two and a half every let's time. Let's just get this as many as I can get and hitting the ground is pissed. Like, so I remember watching the footage and, and Whitey, we were in Portland. It was like, again, super fucking hot. And me and Whitlake were there. And Whitey was like, dude, what are we going to do this footage? I'm like, let's go to the thrift store and buy some stupid outfits. So we like filmed... Like I got a turtleneck and the fucking <laughs> shitty wig. That and like, shit is great. Just like... Ah, God. You know, that kind of, you get into the mode and then you like, we, that was like first take too. Like Whitey was like, 
Everybody was laughing. I think we had to do it one more time because Whitey was losing it and yeah. Scotty was losing it. Yeah. Scotty was like the best dude to go to the thrift store with too because like literally like punk rock, tats all over, like die. we were dying laughing in the thrift store buying that shit. Like, <laughs> and just, I don't know. I just love getting into the mode where you like become something supposedly other than yourself. But I feel like if you get into it, you can just lose your shit. Like, remember when you and me, Stony Buds, were in Montreal? Dude, I'll never forget it. And, like, we were driving around in that minivan with a fucking generator in the back that was leaking gas. Yes. So it was, like, Daryl Mathis and all these people in gas fumes, and you and me were doing French-Canadian accents for, the like, whole trip. two weeks. <laughs> yeah. Two weeks losing our shit. we said. Everybody was, like, cross-eyed, <laughs> the fuck, like, these dudes. <laughs> But I don't think anybody came home. Benny was there too. I think. Yeah, like everybody. It was had a like six the pack. ninety-one words for snow plus your dude years movie combo. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I love that. And then like that night, we all got hammered, and Benny put on my t-shirt. Yeah, and I put on Benny his t-shirt. The t-shirt swap. Was you fucking Alan in, P there too? Jump in bed to he bed. Came and us. Alan P came and drank some fucking <laughs> whiskey with us. with us, dude. Oh. I'll never forget that trip. That Dr- was drinking insane. with LMP was. The best. Oh, man, those are good times. Diesel mechanic now. Oh, yeah. He's I didn't champ. know that. Yeah, he's working on, like, big cat Huge diesels. Yeah. He's got two little, Heavy three equipment. little kids, two kids. He's got yeah. a bunch of kids, a bunch of dogs. Kids. He was a great human to be around. He really is. He was on Holden in the early days. Yeah, I put him on, like, you know, the first, he was second round, I'd say. I heard about him through probably Cooley and those cats going mm-hmm. up. But, yeah, he was sick, man. He was, like, jovial, just a badass, always a down. Great, dude. Always down. That whole Montreal scene to me, Quebec, like, when again. exploded. Yeah, I mean, to me, like like I said earlier, best place to travel to. I don't know if you like it up there, but, like. Yeah, I love it. To me, like. This guy's been to Quebec City, like, 30 times. Probably. I don't know. If someone was, like, times. come out of retirement, we're going to Quebec, I will go. In a heartbeat. Because, I'm first of all, I think it's in my DNA. I got a French name. My grandfather's Le, from Le there. Blanc, He's from Quebec City. But, like, straight up, like. I remember coming from Utah where it was like this like real small crew, like you'd go session and be secret, Mac Dog and Whitey and like I'm not gonna tell you my spots and you go to Quebec and there'd be thirty fucking kids sessioning like a skate scene, shredding. Um and it was just so cool and so different. And also like the the crews out of there, like we met up with this kid Greg that like showed us all around for a little Greg hit. Desjardins? Yeah. yeah. When we met him, he was like 16 or 17. Without <laughs> Greg, dude, we would have been fucked and lost. I'm going to give him an air horn. Yeah. yeah. He deserves Pops. an air horn. All those dudes, though. Everyone I've met that I ever really like got from there, like just honest. Like it or hate it, they're going to tell you exactly what yeah. they think, but they're down. They go hard. They appreciate it. I think they're the hardest working shredders I've yeah. ever met come out of there because the opportunities are slim. I think in Canada, you know, Maybe pre everything, there is a certain hatred of Quebec Quebec folk out west, or at least a lot of competition. Maybe people don't talk about, it, but I feel like it's strongly there. They get um, player hated on. They get yeah. player hated because yeah. they come in hot and they own shit, and they're um, not scared to tell people what they think. Exactly, I yeah. love it. So all right. I'm all about that scene up there. I think they still have it. And like Brothers Factory, big shouts to them. It's good. Air horn, Airhorn. bringing people up. Deja vu. Deja vu was like you know. Things got born out of that, but like a lot of those heads, like I'd be watching those videos, like who's next? Like what's up? Well, back to the JP Jeremy thing, those guys raised the bar on street rails, right? Doing things proper, yourself included. Yeah. And then the Quebecois, Louis and crew come through and yeah. they did the same shit. And it's yeah. like they would, you film with them, I've filmed with them, and they do the trick perfect. And then they do it six more times. Oh, yeah. And you're actually just annoyed. You're, you're like, totally dude, you right. did it. But they, like, hold themselves to the standard where it's like, oh, you can't just come off the end of the rail. You got to, like, everything's got to be. Yeah, I is, disagree with that altogether. I, 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 I'll, let's get into that. I, I mean, I'm back in the skill set. I just don't have that skill set. So, oh, yeah. like, straight up, like, you're totally right. Like, these dudes would show up. I would show up to a rail. I'd be like, all right, cool. My thought process before and still to this day didn't. Everything they did, I respect it, but it's not changed my vibe. I would show up to the rail, one trick in mind, get the trick or not. If I got the trick, I'm out. Those dudes get the trick, do it four more times, and then do ten tricks. And I'm like, fuck, these guys are good. They clinic. 
But really the, good. Yeah. There's a problem sometimes, I think, when somebody does the trick too many times, yep. and maybe the second or third one they landed, yep. maybe their arms were caught up, and that one had a little bit of flavor. Too much steez, yeah. And, and I like, good steez. you can't really put, what it's an intangible word. Yeah. What is this, the likable quality that that you like about a rider? It's this flavor. It's this, yep. it's this spice, right? Yep. And if you do things too perfect, yep. you lack flavor. But some people are are into that totally know, but I, like- I don't know if it's true but yeah i'm i'm with you one million percent like i can think of a couple examples like i think maybe jamie lynn rode without gloves so he had a certain style and didn't touch the ground ever that was cool i think like devin walsh my one of my favorite snowboarders top three for sure his back fives that one arm was rodeoing around a lot but like that's what made it dope i remember getting raw footage again with whitey of blaze rosenthal doing literally like 10 cab nines perfect in a row but if you gave me the chance to edit his part i would have always picked the sketchy one yeah and to him the sketchy part was like one arm movement but like yeah too perfect is just yeah it's too perfect it looks too easy and i'm not saying he's this guy but like we were talking earlier about dirks and like what's the huge jump chad's gap or whatever yeah his his backside nine yeah was like i don't know what 15 years ago flawless yeah. It looked like he was hitting like a twenty foot jump. Yeah, I mean, if he got wild, would people remember it more than that? I don't know. Yeah, that's insane. You know Dude, what? You Dirksen know, gets some air horns. Too. We, we kind of passed name that video Smooth. part. A while oh ago. yeah, we are. Hey, let's, before gonna... we start though, I gotta say, dude, your brainstorm part, my favorite part of. All Thank time you. history. Thank you, man. Dude, for I real, haven't I, seen that part in so long. I, I want to see it. Go back. Is it Dropkick Murphy's? I think so. It's maybe. the one with the yeah. skit. You don't even know. Yeah, it is. It's dropping <laughs> the bar the scene. The bar scene, right? The bar scene. Yeah, that oh, part's yeah. fucking thing incredible. To me, that's my favorite of that all, was so all fun. time, hands down, ever. Thank you, man. Yeah. We're going to give him a. Damn, son. Where'd you, you find this? That was a fun one. Filming I, the skit part was dope because we actually were with the band in Boston. Yeah, I was going to say, there's a little story behind it. No, the band was. The first band was. Well, the first band was these punk rock dudes out of Boston. What are they called? They were like your homies, right? They're homies, but they were a good time. I mean, like we went to a party that night, and they like, let's go out, let's like stab some people. I'm like, nah, that's cool. I'm like, Boston shit, you know, that's real. Let's stab some. They were people. yeah, totally. was, that's a, maybe not quite. Well, I would say that's probably like people. an average Friday night for me. Is like, let's go out and stab some people. I can just kind of relate to that. You know? Boston man. Yeah, but you went and partied with the boys. Well, right? I, we walked into a party, and literally every dude left. Really, and those dudes walked in. Oh, like because oh, they were fuck. straight. These guys I mean, are gonna fuck some people up. They were gang related. There was no doubt. Yeah, so, just just like default mode confrontational. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> Everyone's like, let's just go somewhere else now, quick. <laughs> Felt so horrible. You know, I left. I walked home, and they called me the next day, so pissed. They're like, you "You're one of us. No anyone. one leaves. That's what they without. Said. <laughs> you could have been like, you know." The Boston hardcore. Oh, because if someone oh, yeah. saw you leave alone. Yeah, they might, they were like, you could have gotten fucked up if you didn't like have one of us with you. Like that's their feeling. Like their crew is like it's wow. not, my, not my thing. That was the era of like baseball bats with like spikes and shit on it. Right? Yeah, it's not my thing. That whole hardcore yeah. scene. That's not a, my thing. That's All right, well, thing. should we get into name that video? Yeah, part? We went deep. I need dude. headphones. Right? Yeah, you gotta oh, put, yeah, you throw need the, the headphones you need the on. on. All right, I'm not gonna get this. FYI, I what? think you are. Do I got some fucking? Yeah, we got it. Alright, alright. Presented by the Dew Tour. I'd like to just give a little shout out to the Dew Tour. What up, Dew Tour? Great Talk? event. Been to many of them. Uh, 10 out of 10 would recommend. So, uh, yeah. Good yeah. times. Good people. Good action. Good action. They're supporting the, they're supporting the bomb hole. So you gotta, you gotta love them. Thank you. Um, okay. So. We're going to get into track number one for you. Okay. You get it? We get a little. What do we got for him, bud? Prize pack. We got a little prize pack. What do I win? Well, you're, you have to wait and see if you, you win. Have to it, wait man. And see. We don't want to let you down if so you don't, I don't win. know what's in this pack. I think this is a meatball, dude. If you don't get this one, here we go. Huh, maybe some ollies with a jacket over? Woo! <laughs> MFM, <laughs> baby. He gets the prize the pack. Smoothest to ever do the we Ollie with the jacket. An igloo cooler, bomb hole all over print from yes. our boy Ryan Kingman uh, hooked this up. Kingman. Let me shout shouts yes. to him. Yeah, Hear since that. you're living behind Milo in a tent, dude, that'll come in handy. No doubt. Man. Yeah. Thank you, Milo and Oli, for believing that. <laughs> <laughs> Jackass. Uh, okay, so for part two of N. TVP. That's the abbreviation. Dude, you know what we got to do? Not this one, obviously. Yeah. Next week, we come up with a twofer. 
a two really for Tuesdays. Stung. There's a couple songs that have been used, like same song, two parts. Oh, we need see, to start stumping these. No, you fools. give it to the OG though. If it's the second user, that vote doesn't count. No, but they got to name both. Okay. You know what I mean? We okay. got to start stumping it because these kids are too good. They get it at like 701. There's an answer. There's a lot of students of the game, you could yeah. say. A lot yeah. of students of the game. We got to start making it hard. This one's an OG part. Here we go. So I grew fast. up on. So I grew damn up on fast. That. Well, I figured out if you go under four seconds, they can't it doesn't it. flag the song rights thing. Yeah. Oh, cool. But also, we still get flagged. <laughs> we still get flagged. so we don't know what we're doing. But thank you guys for playing. Name that video part. Sick. Did he say which movie it was in? Did you? you? No, it's you not just, that by. You clarify the name for the listeners. MFM. Okay, yeah. I wasn't sure. Yeah, but yeah. did he say the movie, or it doesn't matter? No, I didn't. I didn't. It doesn't really know. matter. Was it's it? Just, I think it's. It's probably yeah. back and black. He's correct, folks. Yeah. That's correct. Back he and is. Black. That's back another and black. classic it's when he's stomping. Whitey killed it on that. I mean, the that's stomping? a good, good example of Whitey spending his Dude. own money. To make some, to make some cool. dope shit. Dude, Whitey skits, man. I wish someone would step their game up and get at it's least hard. somewhat on the level. You know, jeez. I mean, I think Cole kind of did some cool shit. Yeah, but just, I mean, now. Now yeah. there's oh, nothing. Yeah, now. I don't yeah. know. There's no money. I get it. Whitey had no money, too, so yeah. everybody should know that. Someone's got to come into some young He's crew. like, yo, Marco, we got this water. We're going to need you to stomp around in this shit. Yeah. I mean, that was a legit soundstage. You got those yeah, lights, lights built, the whole thing. <laughs> Yeah, Marco stomping in water. Jeez. Probably oh. got there four hours late for the show. Oh, dude, maybe a day and a half yeah. late. <laughs> <laughs> um, dude, you know what I want to circle back around and talk yeah. about, Mikey? Let's do it. Is I don't know, but let's do it. Entrepreneurial endeavor known <laughs> as Holden Clothing. Why yes. was it filling a yeah. void? Did you feel why like there I, wasn't? Why I started? What's, What's everything? It? Give us everything. Um. I mean, the name too. Yeah, all of cool. it. yeah, 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 for sure. Holden was, I mean, straight up from the book, maybe. Holden was the reason to start it was obvious, like getting packages from brands, which I'm sure writers still have today. You open the box, you're like, this is corny, corny, corny. And at the time, everything looked the same. It was like a color blocked baggy Cookie cutter. And I was wearing th stuff from the thrift store. So was Whitlake. So was a couple other homies. Mm -hmm. We're like, why can't we just like feel normal? Like, we just want to make cool shit. I also had a friend that worked at M3, my co-founder of Holden, this guy, Scott Zergabo, mm. who's still there with me. And uh, we both were, like, kind of into, uh, for lack of a better word, fashion, you know, style. And why can't why does everything we really like have to be, like, a $400 button-up? Why can't we make, like, something dope that's maybe more than you're used to spending, but, like, use nice material? Why can't it look cool, have a nice fit? So it was just kind of like a, why not? You know what I mean? And I remember getting started looking around because I was riding for Volcom at the time. Oh, I didn't know you rode for Volcom. Mad respect to Volcom because when I w left, I initially pitched Holden to the Volcom. I went in with Wooly. I told my team manager first, and I, Wooly was the founder of Volcom. Awesome dude. And I was like, dude, I want to do this thing with you guys as a Volcom. I want to do this certain little line, like make it cool. And he's like, you should do that yourself. And I think looking back, like, he wasn't being a dick. He was like on the positive side. Like, dude, I had a vision. Do it. Yeah. And it was a cool little nudge out the nest. And he's like, cool. Why and if it does your vision. Yeah. And he's like, if it doesn't work, you have an open door back here anytime you want. And they kept, and he's like, and I'm going to keep paying you until you get it going. Damn. And I was like, I'm not going to take your paycheck, but thank you. So props to Wooly Volcom. Super dope. And then I went out and started looking for money. Um, Pitched to Burton, pitched to a few other people. Burton was like, nah, come ride for us. Mm. Like, nah, that's not what I want to do. A bunch of other people kind of, I finally ended up meeting Chris Miller, who ran Planet Earth mm -hmm. and re linked with him. They were doing Planet mm. Earth audio shoes. So we plugged it in there and started it going. And uh, yeah, it was just like uh, the name part was cool. Like, we went through a bunch of names, but I essentially just wanted a name that meant nothing to the average person but also look strong nicely balanced like the n and the h if you really kind of mix it up kind of look similar so visual balance visually and also kind of like doesn't really mean anything to anyone i mean there's a car company in australia that just went out of business called holden but other than that there was no cross up but personally 
Um, I was super influenced by the catcher in the rye. That's, that's what I thought yeah. it came from. Holy yeah, the, he was like, to me, rye. I read that book when I was like 15 in high school. And that dude was like, it was banned in the U.S. if you're unfamiliar with the book. Banned for like 10 years because it was, when it was written, American society was like the cookie cutter, like mom or this, not the drink waiting school, guy. Huh? The drink was waiting for the husband when they got, like the whole bullshit, like American dream shit. This book came out and destroyed it. And to me, he was like the OG punk rocker. And I just read that book and I was like, remember getting excited about it and like going to English class. And like the teacher was like, I never was excited. Right. So like the teacher was like, what'd you guys think about? He's like, he's like, Mike, what'd you think? I was, I loved it. I, I, he's like, did you connect with the main character? I'm like, I've never connected with anybody else like this. And then literally without question, everybody else in the room was like, He's a dick. Fuck him. He's such a negative guy, blah, blah, blah. And at that point, I knew, like, I'm different. I don't believe this shit. I don't believe anything currently to this day, FYI. Me too. <laughs> so, like, you can tell me what you think, but there's only one thing going to happen. It's going to change. So, like, that book was, like, all about, like, calling bullshit. And so that's part of the name. We can't say it because they're heavily. We're not trying to draw an affiliation. It was just yeah. a huge influence. Chris, did you read the book? No, I'm not so familiar. He was probably banned when he was in maybe. school, maybe, because it was like reading for us in, and in out school, like part of the curriculum. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it was banned way, way early. Oh, but, early. Yeah, okay. early in the 50s, so, 60s. So then, so then moving forward, you start the brand. What's that look like when you're like trying to figure out how to run a brand? <laughs> well, the best part was like the first half season, Chris Miller had this brand, Planet Earth. So we. He helped me design the first collection, which was like five pieces or something. And I was like, you know, not a designer, but like, you know, I knew some things I wanted. So I did some fun shit, weird colors, these yellows and Corey Smith always wants me to bring that yellow back because he wrote for us early on and stuff. But like, so then my friend Scott was like, I, I always had a dream of bringing in Scott. So six months in, we bring in this guy, Scott, who's got this crazy eye. And he's like, to me, one of the best designers in snowboarding or skiing or outerwear in the world currently and always has been um i mean he got hit up a month ago from probably the biggest outerwear in the brand in the world that wanted to run their entire shit he's like no not doing it sick but like he brought this elevated element so it was all about fabric and cut and change and like tailoring and like even like the team like we thought tailoring was one thing and then we had whitlake who like designed this crazy bondage pant which is still like one of the most remembered I, yeah, pants. Remember the big pant. zippers and everything on it. We charged three hundred dollars for that pant. It had these zippers called Riri zippers that are literally made in Switzerland. It had two hundred and ninety dollars at cost of Riri zippers on those pants. We sold it for three hundred bucks. We Damn. lost money. But like But it's most remembered. But dude, like we just pushed it and like the team helped push it. It was the vibe early on was like and then getting to make those movies, which were essentially holding movies in a way. Yeah. But I also knew like i'm a big believer in like you know holden i took it was initially like gonna be believe it or not i hit up devin it was almost the first guy to do it with me he had a good thing with dc or whatever and i'm like nah that's cool don't do it and then jeremy was talking to jeremy for a while. i was like nah i'm doing this thing with burton no nah, it's cool so eventually whitlake and he, me and whitlake were tight already but like i was like that was the match so whitlake was a big part of the ideas. Louis Fountain was a big part of the ideas. Like a lot of the, everybody kind of like brought, came together and brought all that energy. But what Scott brought was like the, the really nice fabrics, the eco shit. We were doing the eco stuff before anyone, Patagonia or anybody in the technical shit. Really quick. I think one thing we do and, and still do, that's probably ludicrous, but it's different. Is generally an outerwear brand would be like, all right, like I want to make this coat. I'm going to send the paper design to the factory. They're going to source every zipper, every fabric, everything, and send us back a proto. Well, we were like, we're going to draw this thing. We're going to make a paper pattern. We're going to go to all the fabric vendors, zipper vendors, fucking snap vendors, develop it. We, every piece was like the hard way. You know what I mean? But it made us jump in and learn how to do it differently. You don't just get a shitty boxy fit back and see, like, that's good enough. We're going to have 10 fit meetings. We're going to change the pattern. We're going to fucking get protos. We're going to find these fucking zippers in Switzerland and like tell them we want to make the teeth camo because that's what we want to match our color. Like every little piece, we're psychos about that shit. 
And I think, you know, we could have been a hundred times bigger for sure. But at the end of the day, like we had fun making cool shit and we're still making cool shit. Um, so I think like that's been, you know, the trajectory of Holden is kind of, we always kind of taken the hard road, but I think it's what makes it different and cool. So yeah, stands out. Yeah. What's the future? Future is survive right now, man. Yeah, right. You know? <laughs> Everybody's. Interesting <laughs> time, yeah. I mean, I love it right now because it's so, like, we had to reduce our staff straight up. Um, Every, everyone Everyone's, has. I heard Patagonia laid off 50% of their staff yesterday. Yeah. I don't know if that's true. I'm sure it's true. But, like, it's hard times. But, like, in the last month, dude, I took, I was doing sales with another guy. And we had two guys in marketing. Within the last few months, I am now in charge of sales and marketing. And I'm learning about marketing. If you're looking at Instagram, that's me. If you're looking at graphic design, that's me. If you're looking at sales, that's me. So, like, I'm doing a lot of shit, and I'm not doing it as good as if I could have hired other people to do it. But it's so – it's hard. It's heartfelt. It's about – right now I'm on the phone with so many people I've never met before that are all in the same place. And right now is like it's kind of scary and terrifying, but I feel like the human humanity that's coming out of all this right now too is like the cool guy bullshit. If you got that cool, I'm not gonna deal with you. But in general, like everybody's so down and sensitive right now. Like you could just bring the real. So that's what I'm loving about this. People shit are supporting right now. people. People are supporting real shit. Yeah, the people if that are working dick, hard, caring hard. You're out. But, yeah. like, we're doing real shit, and we're small. We're tiny. We're a tiny brand, and we bring heart straight up. So, like, current with Holden, I mean, we're making – we have some of the best outerwear in the world, but it went high end. It's expensive. It's fucking premium as it gets. It's, we're made in the best factory in the world for technical, which is in Vietnam. Like, it's, like, Arcteryx, Stone Island, Holden. Like, the best Thank brands you. in the world are made there. The quality is insane. The fabrics in Italian or Swiss, the fucking cuts are psycho. Like the weight of the, I mean everything. You put the shit on, and it's like uh. perfect. So you basically went from instead of trying to please all the tears, you just said, "Let's go this direction." We used to make twelve coats end. that had to hit every price yeah. point that had to hit every, and now we make four coats, and Let's three do pants. Us. We're doing us, and then we're doing a lot of street because, like, the reality for Holden is like streets. Is we always enough. wanted to do it. We've never had the ability, but through three or four almost bankruptcies, we've also had the opportunity to like, number one, fuck, we're out of business again. I mean, <laughs> check myself. Do I want to do this? If the answer is yes, okay, cool. What's the changes we want to make? So this time around, last four years ago, we went through a full change, almost bankruptcy, new finance, new logo, new icon, new visual identity, new product, new price point. It was, I love having these moments. And right now the world's going through this moment of like the shit's hitting the fan. Let's fucking choose to do what the fuck we want. So like choose to not be a dick, choose to not be a racist, choose to not be a fucking hater. Like, what do you want to choose to do? Cause like time's now. So we're holding the time is now we're making a choice to like make streetwear more than outerwear. And it's made in Italy. I mean, the shit's fucking nice. Yeah, that's nice. Just, that's top notch for streetwear. That's it's, as good as it gets. Nice, man. dude. It's really and you're nice. still obviously a it's part not owner cheap. Of that, right? Yeah, <laughs> it, but it's, it's, not, it's cheap. not for everybody. But fuck, yeah. man, it's not. You know, it ain't Prada price. But but there's people with money. They're buying and split I, boards. I've, I've noticed you know? two things too. Yeah. So you have you have like a core group of following that you're people that have like only seen where Holden for the past ten years. Yeah, and then also I like what you're saying. It's like it's a time. This uncomfortable time is basically like a great time to reinvent yourself and you have to learn how to adapt. You yep. just have to like things times are changing with especially storefronts and and brands and companies. I mean, dude, you have to adapt. Yeah. yeah adapt I mean, or die. Yeah, totally. It's all about it. And I think like if I could wake up, I wish I could wake up every morning with like an aneurysm kind of mindset of like and I still knew my general parameters, but if I could wake up with fresh eyes every day for everybody I know and my brand, like you could, you wouldn't have all the fear of like, Oh, I tried to call this mag that had said my shit's too whack to get it in there 10 years ago. Or like, yeah. Or like, fuck my girlfriend. If I forgot about what we fought about two weeks ago, like, you know, just fresh. Yeah. Bring the fresh, bring the fresh to everything. Snowboarding, clothing, 
photos, the whole thing. It's just there is an opportunity, and I I try to remind myself of that. And, like, even the most current change of Holden with, like, all the staff turnover and all that shit, like, I'm learning I, literally this week I learned how to do, like, Ten things. Yeah, I was gonna say you must be learning so much with taking At on least. all this new new yeah. hats for the company. Yeah, man, and like, it's cool. And those are th- skills that are gonna be great for you. So. I mean, I may never never use the skill I learned this week of making gifts again, but like now I know how to do it. It's yeah, cool. you, you know, probably, what I mean? you know what's an epiphany it. I just yeah. had, boys. I'm kind of sitting in the middle of kind of two movements that were kind of. Player hating on each other when we whole, never player like not, not, on no, each like other. the groups, the groups. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of like, cool. And, and interesting, you have Tech Nine with East uh-huh. Stone, he who's owner, not owner anymore. Yeah. Uh, but I don't even know if it's still a company. But Baggy, huge, yeah. massive yeah. rap music, and then you have Holden, the original tailored tight yep. pant. Yep. And it was my generation growing up was tight pants versus baggy pants. Yeah. Here yeah, I am. The two sides I'm, of sit- the movement. I'm sitting in the middle <laughs> of the fucking movement here. Well, I mean, I got nothing but mad respect for tech nine. It, to me, it was like they had a vision and it was executed through. And we had a vision that was executed through. Now, when I made the Holden movies, who was the first filmer I hired, yeah, hired outside Cole. of Shelby, <laughs> I stole Cole to make the Holden movie with me, but also knowing that like his work ethic, the is psycho psycho yeah he brings like i know i had to have mfm in the movie i had to have benny in the movies i had to have like that element because contrast we didn't want just like the tight pant hebel dude in the movie with the cool hipster rock song we wanted hip-hop we wanted the whole universe yeah so bringing in cole and mfm and benny and like that crew and then a lot a lot of there's the, the sad part that I see about a lot of things is like, I love when people execute a clear vision, but I hate that there's still this competition. Cause to me, I never felt the competition cause I'm selling to a completely different person than yeah. the tech nine kid. Yeah, same here. So there's this dope universe that we're commu- like coming together to make in snowboarding through these two different movements and other movements. Yeah. But like we put them together cause we're like, I got respect for you. You got respect for me. I am a fucking hipster, but I love hip hop. And these dudes are fucking Cole loves fucking Slayer. So yeah. like all the whole persona of like I'm this, you're that, but uh, shattering that with the movies and adding it all together, like that's it's cool. A dope thing, yeah. It's dope. And we brought in Bertner too. You can't forget that. Yeah. Yep. So and he would hit all the jumps when you were done. I remember hearing stories. I heard all the stories oh, too. Also, yeah. <laughs> also, being younger, growing up watching those, there was some weird setting on your camera that was yellow or something or like yeah. orangish. Yeah. And it was like. It, looking back on it, it was completely jacked. Yeah. But it, like we tried to make our shit look like that, but it was so genious because yeah. it, it created a... It created was it like on the fe- lifestyles or was it on the footy? No, like the footy, you guys hitting backcountry yeah. jumps, yeah. like being, especially that you went to roll jump. Yeah. Like that, it yeah. was like almost orange. That and, was Shelby, man. All this Shelby. shit was so jacked looking, but we loved it. Like, yeah. it, and it gave it a feeling mm-hmm. of specific. It gave it its own feel. Yeah, it, didn't it didn't wanna... look like Super 8. Shelby was... Uh... Such a find because he actually, when I brought him in to make love, hey, he like, he hated snowboarding. Yeah. Like, I got his number from, I think, Josh Roberts at Milo. I called him like, hey, like, you know, this kid Shelby makes you. He's like, yeah, but why do you want to get a hold of him? I'm like, I want him to make a snowboard movie with me. And you're like, huh, good luck with that. Like, pretty much. And I'm like, <laughs> I got a hold of Shelby and remember calling him on the phone. I'd never met him. And I was like, hey, dude, like, I see, I'm Mikey. I don't know if you know who I am. He's like, oh, I think I heard of you. And I'm like, I want to make a snowboard movie and I want you to make it with me. And he's like, uh, <laughs> why? I don't even like snowboarding. Like, well, because your skate videos are sick and I love the vibe. Like, and I know you have snowboard cause you're from Utah. So we met and got together and I was like, and the kicker I think to Shelby was like, he'd probably made like $8 an hour at my own. I'm like, dude, you're going to make more money than you've ever made in your life. He's so like, I'm in. Let's do this. <laughs> Yeah, and then I remember having the first meeting at my house. I called everybody into my house and, like, had, like, Hebel and Maddie Ryan and fucking Justin Benny and all these coal was there. Fucking all the heads were there. And then Mark Frank rolls in, like, royalty, like, 30 minutes late and looks Tip. around. Mark was quite in yet. And I was, he's like, he's like, what? Like what? Are, and I, we did this meeting where, like, this is what we're going to do. We're going to change the look and feel of snowboarding. We're shooting digital. And everybody's question was like, well, no one's going to let us shoot on digital. No one's going to do this. And how are you going to get the money? And I was like, shut up. We're doing it. Yeah. 
So like I started calling around, getting the money, called 10 brands, got other brands to kick in. I remember Jeff Taylor green lighted this shit. Who was the skate manager at audio? He's an OG. Thank you, Jeff. But he fucking green lighted it before I had a dollar. I'm like, dude, you wait, I'm going to get 120 grand and make this movie. So I called all my homies, ride George Kleckner at fucking all, you know, North wave and got the whole budget paid for, um, and the pitch was like, we're going to, it's strength in numbers. Like my entire career was strength in numbers, like not one sponsor because it's just one avenue. I, like if you give me money, you're going to put love, hate in your ads, like see this movie, do like everybody float the boat. And that's what made those movies strong too. Like we, if we just made that movie and didn't have 10 sponsors, it would have been a cult classic maybe, but no one would have seen it. Yeah. But like bringing MFM and like on the second movie, Travis and like some of those people, like, those elements of like more vibe. I don't know. That just Shelby was like the one though. Like he's the piece that made it look different. Mm -hmm. Like I would edit all the snowboard parts and tell him what was cool. Like he would try to stick like a backside 360 as the ender shot. I'm like, no, fuck you. You're being lazy. That goes here. This goes there. But he would put all the sauce in. Dude. That's sick. Yeah, he was the man. Was there a reason behind two videos or? Is there thought behind that? What do you mean two videos? Like making like, two like only instead making of two ten? Oh, instead yeah. Of, yeah, like, because it's like, now it's timeless. It, yeah, yeah, Is, yeah. That, is that a fourth so. thought? Too many of those, dude. I mean, dude, it's like, so. A good album. I mean, dude, every band comes to this point. Like, there are bands that are built for longevity. There are, and they keep going, like Rolling Stones, like whatever. They're fucking time-chested. But then there's bands like Interpol that have two good albums and then put out a shitty one. Or like, you know, it's just... You got to know when the time's up and like, it's like dating someone. It's like, that was magic. Why ruin it with a third year, you know? And like even robot food, couple epic ones. And then the third year you hear rumors about how they all hated each other and fucking, yeah, we weren't there yet, but like, I can tell you straight up like Cole and Shelby and all those dudes were getting sick of filming Justin Hebel for three days trying to get a fucking trick. I would hear all about that. And he put down the sickest shit of all time, but like, you know, there were points everybody was ready to like just call it. Why not? Like walk away when it's good. Yeah, you know shit I mean? was hot. Fuck. You kinda know when to hold them, know when to fold them. Exactly. That's Kenny said up. it well. Yeah. Man. <laughs> Kenny knows what's up. He, he probably didn't write that song, but got some So I had song. our uh Patreon is where people support us. I don't know if you heard of that. I haven't. They're like uh people that enjoy the show. Yep. They sign up for a monthly thing, and oh, cool. they get cool stuff like mugs and stickers and yep. photo prints. And But I had uh, the people that sign up, they get perks, and so I had some of them. I reached out to them and let them ask some questions. Cool. So this is from uh, Sean Fitzpatrick. All right. He's a supporter of Patreon. Thank you. Big fan. Sick. Hi, Sean. Um, and this is a question I wanted to ask, too. He wants to know about the Big Ollie. Oh, yep. The big, the big dog. Yep. And I, I have a backup question to it. So yeah, he just two wants parter. To, it's a two parter. It's a two parter. He wants to hear, to he hear about focused. hitting the massive stair set to flat. It's one of his memorable tricks of yours of all time. The impact must have been so gnarly. He just kind of wants to hear about the session. Sure. And my question to also add into this: there's folklore, and I don't know if this is true. You ripped a piece of a phone book mm-hmm. out <laughs> and put it in your mouth as a mouth guard. <laughs> And uh, I don't know if that's true or not, but I I heard you've done that before. So the it was a piece of something I ripped, but it was my T-shirt. So oh, okay. I ripped a piece of a T-shirt off. And I always ran. I actually forgot a mouth guard because when I would do big ollies, I wore a mouth guard because I have broken countless teeth doing shit. Um, I mean, literally, like, I remember riding down this one rail up in the abs where I tried a front board and I – ground my tooth down the rail oh, it was a rusty <laughs> rail and there was a white stripe like of your tooth four feet long from where my tooth hit the rusty rail and it smelled like the dentist like the smelling of like oh, the burning teeth be cringe that so i always i started up. wearing it but i forgot my fucking uh mouth guard so i ripped off a t-shirt and wore it and it helps with Folded breaking it teeth up, popped it in but also all these micro i think constantly athletes are especially in snowboarding, dealing with these micro um, brain injuries, concussions. And I know, like, every time you see lights, it's a micro concussion. So I wanted to cut down on that. But, yeah, the ollie was cool. I mean, we talked about earlier about how you could have one shot, one, like one good 
shot for the year is worth a hundred shitty ones. So I had gone the whole year. I was the last year of my ride contract. Been lazy as fuck. I think I was hurt. Zero shots for video grass. Um, and we were at Big Bear, and I'm, I'd been looking for a set for years because I had done a set like maybe 10 feet long, shorter and 10 feet less distance than that before, but I've been looking for the right one. And I remember being there, and uh, and Joe Carlino was like, dude, have you ever seen the set behind Big Bear? And I'm like, nah, let's go peep it. So I go, and I'm with Joe, even though Joe was filming for Transworld, which is, again, cool, like everybody's homies, right? So like we go and look, and I'm like, I think I can all do this. And it was at the Ashbury demo. So everybody went to the demo. I went home, had a beer or two, took a nap, love naps. And I get shook up, woken up, and it's Joe Carlino. I was like, hey, you want to go do that ollie? And I was kind of like, in the back of my mind, I was like, I don't. Again, back to 50-50 chance. I thought I had like a 20% chance of totally. landing. So we went, set it up, get kicked out by the cops before I got to try it. And then we went back. A couple hours later, with the huge crew, the first time was just a few people hanging out. Went back with the big crew, had like two people pulling two bungees. All those dudes down and Belok was in the Belok yeah, was my man was doing. He was packing the out landing. the landing perfectly, and uh, just fucking sent it once, going like sixty, and I was like, I think I can do this, and. Uh, yeah, I mean that was a big set, dude. Isn't speed <laughs> no shit. isn't speed the key to landing? It's all physics, dude. So like, you know, the biggest Ollie I think ever done was Louis Fountain. He had this one in Robot Food where I remember being jealous because he went down this like 30 stair, but it was like vert and he went off with zero speed and stomped it. And I was like, that it's not the biggest set, but like the way he did it with physics, he took more impact. My thing was always about like Go as fast and as far as you can because it's simple. It's like, do you want to go like this or do you want to go like this? Yeah. And so it's all about that set was perfect because it was huge, but it was a long set. It had like a 10-foot flat in the middle. And, yeah, man, it was fucking sent it, and I knew I could do it after a few. And then the guy came out again. He was like, the cops are coming again. So, like, you turn up the heat. Luif was at the top. I've talked about this before, but without Luif there, who's kind of a Zen master. He guy's a man of few words. Yes, yeah. he is. But at the top, we're pulling the thing, and I'm, I'm like, ready, ready. He's like, you're not ready. He's like, wait. Take some breaths. When you're ready, you tell me to go. Damn. And then I, like, took the breath. Boss. That was the one. That was the one right there. He fucking shut, shut me down. Shut you down. Slowed you down. me back. He, he, Big Lou gets some air Big horns. Lou, man. I, I mean, mean, that's the shot, wait, so right? This is it right here. It's behind my head. Yes. Who <laughs> shot that? <laughs> Zacher. Zacher, Kevin Zacher. He came out of the work. The first photo he'd shot in like Dude, three years. Dude, look how big it looks. And the thing that's amazing, Doesn't even give amazing it the length. about this says, Grendies, promise me one thing. You will always do dumb shit. <laughs> and I, yeah, I honestly, sure. Mikey, have lived by that. Like, you know, a lot of people <laughs> are like, I mean, I really have. If you follow my life, I just like run shit over with golf carts yeah. and shit. And, not, yeah. and I always have that in the back of my mind because a lot of people are like, Grendies. <laughs> Be financially stable. Put some money away. Yeah. Like, don't buy dumb stuff. Take risks. And you're just like, hey, just like signing this poster. Like, yo, you sign my poster. You're like, always do dumb shit. You're just like, it's the best advice ever. <laughs> yeah. like, Send it. <laughs> Fuck it. I mean, that rail, that ollie was like my dream, honestly. And it was. So two tries? No. Like no, eight, uh, uh, like eight or nine. And I think like, again, like the, so landing that was epic because like, the current, I was fucking washed up. My end of my career right there, my contract was up in a few months, no video part, but like landing it and riding out and having like someone like Jed Anderson, who to me at that time and still to this day, to me, Jed Anderson is the goat on handrails of all time for sure. No question. But he came up and his mind was blown. He's like, dude, that was insane. And it's like hearing props from my little buddy who was you know, you can be older and he, someone could still be your hero. He was my yeah. hero. So, like, having all those homies, LMP and fucking the whole crew. And I remember the best part about the Ollie was being like, all right, let's go party. And we partied in the hotel room. And, like, we went to the hotel. We're partying. Fucking the, the hotel called a few times. We're like, look, what, come look at this footage. Like, <laughs> we're partying. Like, no way we're shutting this down. And Pizza Kids showed up, like, Shredder's. 
And they were like, we brought them and showed it, and they called work. We're like, we're not going back. We're not coming back to work because they were partying with us. They so were so it like, was just sick. It was dude. a moment. infectious Huge energy party. of party. Yeah. yeah, man. It was just that's the cool shit. It's kind of a send off, dude. That's a rad story. It was my last shot I ever filmed. Holy shit. I mean, wow. like I would that say you were hyped on. That I was hyped on, yeah. And like, also, I think, you know, why not go out? With bang, similar to the video thing. Like, yeah. you know, you see people milk it. I could have milked it. I could have definitely taken some money from some people. But at the same time, I was like, you know, I got nothing against milking it, if that's what you want to do. But I had other shit you to do. You had a brand going on. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, send it. I'm going to okay. do a little pivot, boys. Pivot, pivot. dog. That's we're a term we like to use. Yeah, we're mixing up some questions here. Yeah, so. we're, uh, but a lot of people know you're snowboarding and all this <laughs> shit, but... One thing, like, a lot of people don't know about you <laughs> that I think is interesting yeah. is the meditation stuff. And uh, Shane Charblaw once explained it to me very well. And <laughs> is Shane's incredible voice the in the way he explained it. He's like, dude, I just went to, like, the place where Mikey goes and meditates. He's like, dude, it's insane. He's like, you just sit on a concrete floor <laughs> and do nothing. <laughs> for hours. Yeah. He's like, it's the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. He's like, you think it's going up to the top thing. of the mountain is hard? He's like, you think snowboarding is hard? He's like, try going and sitting on a concrete floor for two hours and not talking. Yeah. You're like, I was like, holy shit. But yeah. For two hours. That? Well, I mean, uh, yeah. I mean, generally, yeah, I've been doing Zen You're meditation. You're a monk, right? I'm a Zen monk, which technically makes me a priest, the evil priest. He's a monk, folks. Wow. But, a uh, killer priest. Yeah, but I mean, fuck, I started in when I was 28, I'm 48 now, 47, so been doing it a while, but it's been like, yeah, I mean, during my snowboard career, it was, it was, you know, I would do like three month long silent retreats, like long stretches. Three months of yeah. silence. I've done two or three, three month silent retreats and a couple months long. I don't know if Chris and I could pull that retreats. off. That's not going to work for me. J2 was my roommate at the time, which made it extremely difficult. <laughs> Yeah, him talking to that you. fool would come home and I'd be like. Well, you couldn't talk to him. Every day I would come home and remind him, like, dude. I'm not, like, Because the whole thing about, like, the reason why Shane probably says it's hard uh, is that you all you do is sit there and watch what your mind is doing all the time. So for the first time, the first time you try to meditate, the common thing is, and I'm stoked on how much people are talking about meditation, but wherever you look now. On Instagram, every CEO, every fucking kid, every whoever the fuck they are, if they're worth their salt, they're doing some form of meditation. And I think when I started, it was less common. Um, and I think it's cool to see how many people are trying it. But now that so many people are trying, a few people have come to me and be like, hey, I heard you do this. Let's get started. How do I help? Then they come back a week later. It's like, I, I suck at this. It's so hard. And it, all, it, all it is is it's not hard you're just sitting there and noticing what your brain is constantly doing probably when you're sleeping too so after a while i mean it starts to slowly take effect and i mean like slowly as in i'm 20 years deep and i'm becoming a beginner now at this shit you know it's a long haul but the best way to describe it you know that i've ever heard is everybody's mind is a glass of dirty water that's spun up and it's dirt but if you just let the water sit in the glass, eventually it settles to the bottom and it's clear watered with your dirt. I mean, that's what meditation does. It doesn't matter your form. There's all kinds of ways to do it. I have my own preference for Zen, but like it's been, it's for the last 15 years, it's been my uh, number one focus of things to do as much as I can get myself to do it. So on a weekly basis, like how much time do you put into this shit? Like what do you? Uh, I go to, I have like probably, I sit probably three days a week on a good week. Um, I've been, there's been points where I do it every day a week. I just did a retreat a couple weekends ago for a week. Um, and this, how no long talks increments? Yeah, the teacher will talk. I have a teacher. Um, and yeah, I mean, silence is cool too because when you get up off the cushion when you're sitting, um, the idea of a silent retreat is that you then go throughout your day and you start to not do, like if you and I were passing each other in the halls, Norman would be like, Hey, what's up? You make eye contact. Like you kind of have these fallback like patterns that you do that actually keep you separate from your world. Cause you just, if you're just repeating what, if 
you're unconsciously repeating all your fears and then your thoughts. Meditation first sorts to help you kind of see what's happening there and then it settles into something more reasonable. Um, but if you're walking around and you're just being like, hey, you know, you're calling, fall, falling back on your little patterns, which we all have, I have them all day long. If I can sh- sort of not do that for a week, you start to kind of like create what's called the gap or some space. And you start to see how you're maybe trying to manipulate this person into doing what you want, or they're manipulating you, or you're like starting to see how you have a pattern for doing something that you may be positive and may not be, but you start to notice what you're doing because you're almost kind of creating a gap between what you normally do and what you actually, because you're, we're all alive right now. But 99% of the time we're just kind of in a, in a pre-built pattern state. Like autopilot. Auto, autopilot. Yeah, yeah exactly. autopilot. Perfectly said. So just these retreats just take you out of autopilot. It's exhausting. Part of the format on these long form retreats is you get exhausted after day two or three. You start to lose your shit. Wow. And the words the teachers start saying, you know, start to penetrate. You start to notice these things. You might have a conversation with a fucking leaf or you might, you know, notice, you know, some fear that comes up. So it's just been incredibly helpful for me. So it's kind of like, obviously you're trying to make your mind kind of blank is the goal, but a lot of times there's probably a lot of introspection too. And you see your own bullshit for what it is. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think the, the common thing about meditation that people think is I'm going to stop thinking. Yeah. And that's impossible. The brain is a muscle. Yeah. It's a fuck. It's like your blood. I mean, it happens. Your brain will always happen. The, thing that meditation teaches you is if every thought is a fish hook and you're biting on every fish hook which is the standard practice that everybody does we every pattern is a fish hook we generally bite every fish hook going by but through a meditation over time you then start to pick and choose which hook you want to bite yeah because um, you got to keep i mean your thinking's yeah. never going to stop true but you absolutely start to create space between yourself and the automatic motion of grabbing a thought. And if you don't grab every thought that comes by, you don't get taken on a ride. Like we've all been there and been the like wormholes, man. that girl's nah. cute. Next thing you know, five minutes later, you've either have slept with her or you're getting married or you're divorced. It's like <laughs> your mind can take you on a, a magical vision, mm. but it's really cool when you can choose which one, which one you want to fucking go down. And I think some of the best creative people, whether they meditate or not, kind of have learned to put themselves into a creative state of like this flow that creates new things. Like the best artists to me aren't the person that shoot, paints the same painting, you know, just because it's sold, but they're, they change. One of my favorite painters is Goya. And if you look at his career, it's like every 10 years he changed completely. Reinvents his old shit. Yeah. That's and then sick. on the same side, Picasso used to paint that fucking guitar painting which mm-hmm. is his famous one and i remember hearing the story where he painted the same painting a hundred times and some critic came and was like you paint the same guitar a hundred times why do you paint the same painting he's like every painting's different mm. what are you talking about yeah but he was on another fucking level of like yeah. he had already he could paint anything but he chose to, you know so i don't know Me- yeah. meditation's been rad for me and has it ever led to out of body experiences? Because I know for some people it does. It's led it. to in body experiences. In body. Because I think we don't really exist in our body most of the time. We're mostly in a dream world following a scenario mindset. And what it does is it puts you back into your body, if anything, mm-hmm. and creates like, because I, I think, you know, myself, my trajectory, and I'm still, like I said, I'm still a beginner at this, but my trajectory with meditation has led me from the first couple of years to like, so jazzed up, telling everybody about it. You got to do this shit. Kind of yeah, annoying. Uh, up on the soapbox. Annoying. Everybody's yeah, on the soapbox when yeah. they first discover any kind of opening, big, small, whatever. And I had had my own openings through either, as you mentioned earlier, psychedelics or athletics or had those moments of like, you're just there. Like, yeah. And I think the out-of-body experience may be something people experience when they're dying, but I think what it's maybe – wrongly said i think we're actually finally re-entering our like reality of like i'm fucking here in my body yeah. i'm living right now instead of on a mind trip so the first couple of years with meditation i kind of came in got excited 
the last 15 years have been a grind of like realizing that all the stuff I thought that was cooler that I learned about meditation was just a bunch of new shit that I thought was better than everybody else knew. So now I'm throwing that away and starting to approach it all as no one knows what the fuck they're talking about as much as possible erase everything I know and show up in my body as much as I can remember to this experience without any preconception. And I think it was really nice. You can learn from your past bullshit, but like, I like showing up to meeting like someone like, let's say you're dating someone new. And like, I remember doing this with some people and I'm with a gal now, but like before when I was dating, I would notice where let's start dating a girl first date. And you're like, oh, cool. Like, I know these things about her now because we've had our first date. I know she likes this, this, and this. I think we connect here. And you slowly start to build this relationship of, like, the boxes you guys fit together in. But really all that does is put her in a box. It puts me in a fucking box. So how can I approach my second date is, I don't know who the fuck this person is. Nice. And when she's walking up, like, all right, like, why don't I really just see? Like, re- like, and re- so that's my current kind of focus. It's is like, how do I not box the world into something manageable? It's a very fear based thing that we all do. It's about fear and about managing your trying to control your surroundings, which is a futile effort. It's impossible. Two, two things I want to touch on here in that is that it, there's an author I was just listening to, forget his name, but uh, he was talking about how. Like true love is seeing the person through a new set of lo- set of eyes or new set of lenses every day. Yeah, and it's like you sometimes you see it when you break up with somebody. You're like, oh, yeah. like I didn't, I got comfortable with this person. My right. lenses were all foggy, right. or whatever. Then you see, it. or the other the other thing I was thinking about too is I think meditation comes in other forms, and I don't know if mm-hmm. you follow the same form, but I I just feel like it boils down sometimes to like extreme presence, mm-hmm. like full fully present, not mm-hmm. thinking about. Um, other things that are happening at that moment, but fully focusing yeah. on that exact moment of what you're doing and certain, like the two things that do it for me, riding, mo- riding dirt bikes. Yeah. Cause you're going fast. You're making Fuck critical yeah. decisions. No time. There's no, you're <laughs> nothing. You're, it's all critical on the fly decision making. Yeah. And it, and it's a force. It's a form of meditation. Yeah. And then I get it sometimes when I'm welding and I'm like really in the zone and I'm just, just focusing on that little thing. Or, yeah. But it, I do view those as meditations mm-hmm. and I don't know if that, I mean, I can't tell you if it is or isn't. Yeah. I'm not going to be that guy because I don't know. Yeah. I think whatever you're like in the moment doing, like meditation is just a practice that you apply hopefully to your whole life. Okay. Like meditation isn't a religion. It's not, it can be, people put it in the format of religion or spirituality. You got to sit in a chair and do it this certain way. My current understanding of Zen meditation is it's pattern recognition. And that kind of removes some of, I'm not going to deny that there's, shit way bigger than us that we don't know about and you could call that spiritual Mm -hmm. but to me right now it's about pattern recognition and it's like what are my patterns and how do i recognize them and drop them to show up for welding or fucking motocrossing i remember snowboarding quite a few times where you come out of especially in big mountain snowboarding where you're like in a line situation like Giggy said it best to me when we were snowboarding one time, we were filming with absinthe up at fucking timber lakes and we're dropping into this pillow section and he's like, what are you going to do? And I'm like, I'm going to fucking drop in off that pillow. I'm going to turn left, hit this tree, do that, do this trick, blah, blah. And of course, when I dropped in, none of it went right. <laughs> Cause I had a bunch of fucking ideas about what I was going to do. And I'm like, but before I had it all got it all wrong, I was like, well, what are you going to do? And he's like, I'm going to drop in and see what the mountain tells me to do. Sick. That's what he said? Yeah, in his cute little Austrian accent. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. Oh, my God. Duh, duh, duh. You know, horrible <laughs> slaughter. Sorry, dude. Yeah, that was a slaughter. But, like, the most zen shit I've ever heard for I'm lack gonna of I'm going to do what the way. mountain tells me to do. Yeah, and that's the day. I don't know if it was the first time, but it was he hit the tree and, like, spun out of that. Mm-hmm. And it was, like, one of the first times I'd seen it. Yeah. But he literally is, like, to me, Giggy's at the top of the list of people that have the flow. He definitely has times where he's forcing it, but he definitely has times where he's in it mm-hmm. deep. And like, you can see it on film like that. He is fucking shredding with whatever's showing up right here. And it's rare. Like you could, you could get that on a hand realm, but for sure. Um, 
but it's more common in a line situation where you're like being approached with high speed Critical objects. decisions. Yeah. I mean, I can't imagine the psychos that do that shit like up at yeah. in AK, dude. Yeah. Another well, level. That's also reminds me of that famous Craig Kelly saying, be the ball. Yeah. Right? If you were to roll a ball down the hill, yep. which way, where would it go? And that's yep. the way to approach the mountain. Totally. And totally. I like to call myself on the snow. I like to call myself the Craig Kelly of snowmobiling. Yeah. When I go uphill, I uh-huh. say, you know, <laughs> yeah. be the reverse ball. Yeah. yeah. That's be like a ski ball that's going, ball. that was rolled up the hill. You know? I would love to ask. <laughs> and if you ever get him on the show, like, to me, like the guys that do the big mountain shit, like they deal with this more than like the rail riders and stuff. And I think rail lines, you can start to get into this mindset. But like the dudes like Travis and, and Nico and Giggy and the guys that like really shred the big mountain stuff, like how often out of the thousand lines that they've ever done went how they act? Because, you know, they're carefully mapping like for their lives sake, where they're going to go. I tried like, you know, a hundred or 200 lines in my life. Never, not one turned out. Even if you had like a photo of the spot. Oh yeah. I mean, it might've turned out great and it ended up in a video, but like it never turned out. Didn't translate perfectly. Like where that turn was going to happen or how this was going to happen. Yeah. And how they approach that would be incredibly interesting because, you know, you do have to plan out your line when you drop in for your lives sake. I wonder, I wonder what degree of it is a reset. Because I think sometimes I, in my head, I feel like some of these guys go to these zones. Yeah. They ride it. Yeah. It, yeah and then it sure. snows. Yeah. And it resets. Yeah. And they ride it. And so they've already ridden it once. So they know how it's going to react. Yeah. And so they oh, I should have start 20 feet higher. Well, I think that happens for it sure. It happens that, a lot. And they'll but, go back four times maybe. Yeah. Travis will talk or the about it. They'll go back wrong. years later. Yeah, the light's wrong. So they they hit it. And, then and they've like, scoped it for Next years. Next time we got to be here at 7 in the morning. Yeah, Travis had a post on his Instagram like two days ago. He's like, we looked at the sign that. for four weeks. Blah, blah, yeah. blah. It was the first day we could ride at the snow. But like even my favorite cliff shot I ever had was like one at Brighton where I air off and hit this cornice and land at like on the side cornice. Yeah. And I, that was like fourth try that year. I knew that I didn't know the cornice was going to break every time the first time I hit it. Mm-hmm. So that was new the first time. And the second time I didn't know you had to turn hard. And so yeah, yeah the reset. Learn. I love that when you can go back to the same mm-hmm. spot. Safer, it's so that's cool. For sure. <laughs> Your confidence is just way higher. Yeah. You know, it's going to, it's more of a controlled environment. That, totally. And that's a, as a street rider, that's the thing too, with the, the convex rolls and you get, you look at it, from the bottom and you're like, okay, I'm going to go down there. I'm going to do a 540 off yeah. of this. You get to the top. You're like, I don't even know what the fuck I was planning on jumping off. Am, what yeah. tree Which, was I yeah, referencing? Yeah, like, like what, where am I? Dude, and then so much not going fast enough, never going fast enough. You always got to go twice as fast as oh, you think. God. And yeah. Yeah. yeah I got short track it. <laughs> mad respect. That new Travis movie was psycho yeah. dark matter with like that couple of those lines shot. So nice too. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Insane. Psycho. I got dude. one more Patreon question sure, for you. Sure. This uh Mike J is his name. What up, Mike? What up, Mike? <laughs> Mike and Mike. <laughs> Mike he, uh him. he wants to know if you think professional snowboarders have it better or worse today than fifteen to twenty years ago. And why? <sighs> Jeez, man. That's, that's a loaded tough. question. Loaded, yes. Yeah, it's it's impossible to answer. I mean, tough. I'll give my best attempt, but I think it's just from a business perspective, it's harder because there's less money and there's less brands. From a creative perspective, it's way better than 15 years ago because you've got less kooky brands and team managers that I think I think the brand the there's less media right now, so that you can promote what you want about yourself and your scene and your homies on the gram way better and there's like a couple sites yes people go there but like in general you get to t- say what you want 15 years ago i was talking with austin smith like you got one interview every three years and you took it serious because like that's the chance. only place your photos are going and so you know and you might like not get to sound off so there's positives and negatives to it but i think financially it's way harder for dudes right now and women but at the same time there's more opportunity for women and than there ever was maybe right now, which is good. Um, so I think creatively it's a way better time than it was 15 years ago. Cause there's more avenues to tell what you're about. Like I love seeing like 
Cole and those kids like shooting photos, like Daryl and Cole and all their dope photography shit coming out of this. Cool. Like it just gets posted up. It's dope. And Vans, props to them for putting together like a outlet for that too. And but just it's a cooler time creatively, financially, it's harder. That's my I think thing. that's a great answer. If you look at the volume of people, it's like way when less. you were there, there was way less people. Yeah. There's also way less brands. Yep. Now there's way more people, yep. more brands, but it's more diluted. Mm-hmm. So that seems to be the major issue. I think. Yeah, I think it's cool too because like for, as a fan, which I currently am now, it's like I can kind of really dive into like a couple of the little like niches that I dig, you know? Like it's real easy if I'm like, I, if I'm sitting there and I'm like, oh, I want to see a fucking dope line, I can like look at you know, Travis or you know where to go. I want to go there. I can just see it. I don't need to flip through a magazine or go to a website. I could just, or if I want to like get inspired about a photo in fashion, like a portrait, I can just boom. Like, so I think, you know, not just in snowboarding, but inside of snowboarding, the niches can be further developed and you can dive in further. Like I love like the, I forget the the name of the group of how there's like these, the, the new like the dust box the dust box yeah like <laughs> dude they get mentioned every episode man well Props to them. and also what is it scene snowboarding like the meetup groups oh, that, yeah, uh, if you're sorry. gay and you want to come out and you got you got yep. a family like that shit is epic like bringing uh all of those things that are kind of coming out as like these little group no pun intended coming out but like there's like all these ways to connect with the little niche things that also in the case of like a scene could save someone's fucking life right now. Yeah. Yes. Or give them five more years to fucking be themselves, which is so fucking dumb. huge. Yeah. I love that about snowboarding right now. And the community, I feel so good about the community. Of course there's some fucking kooks. There always are, but always in is. general, the vibe right now with black lives matter and with like the huge tournament thing with like, all the coming out and like all that's going to come out of these things. Fuck. Yeah. Snowboarding. Yeah. It's changing sick. people's I'm lives. I'm so it, proud of it. It, it yeah. makes, makes you be proud to be a snowboarder, not to put a label on yourself, but yeah. fuck didn't, I don't think I ever was as proud as I am now. No, man. This shit. It's sick. I mean, I got so much stoke right now for it. I mean, I've never lost the love of snowboarding, but like just the, the universe, like I've always felt like, there was a failure in the media and given I can't beat them up too hard. Cause they literally had like eight issues to fucking say it all. Yeah. But like the fact that now you can see the bomb hole on snowboarder, but you could go to pleasure mag and see an article about gay snowboarding. But like also there's all these individual people that are essentially their own media outlets that are creating this universe of snowboarding because it's always been had to be put into this package of trick or this niche, or this thing, but now you can literally, like, it's starting to slowly develop into this, like, rather than this, like, competitive thing, everybody's kind of like, fuck it, like, you can, you know, let's all combine and do, at least that's where I see it heading, like, let's all combine and talk about all the rad shit, you know? Like a rising tide raises all boats situation. I've always hated it, for example, like, I was talking about Tech 9 and Holden, like, Sure, we sold. We were one of 20 outerwear brands that sold to whatever store. But, like, we're homies. Like, yeah. I would, if people asked me even back in the day when you guys were here, be like, what's cool? I'm like, Tech Nine's cool. They yeah. do their own thing. And we would say the same thing. I, yeah. Like, North Face and fucking all these other brands that are knocking off my collection a year later. <laughs> fuck them. Yeah. You know? Well, but that, like, that mindset. They weren't of- copying my shit. So, yeah. Or, and I wasn't copying your shit. Like, yeah. we had, so, like, whoever. I love North Face. The, yeah. the feast or famine mentality is just, it's so yeah. fucking whack. Like, yeah. there's room for everybody at the table. Yeah, that's the thing. There's room for everybody. Yep. Yeah, and building that universe of, like, you know, positive vibes. Like, it, it's this whole thing we're in this for is, like, love. Like, we all love being outside, first and foremost. The whole ski against snowboard thing. Yes. There are some fucking kooky old school white guy skiers that are dicks. But in general, it's changing. Everybody likes being outdoors. In yeah. the summer, everybody's climbing together. Like that whole thing is a joke. Like, you know, it's always been a joke. And you talk to skiers, they 
watch all the snowboard right. videos and they're so hyped and right. I'll tell you what, I like that Alta doesn't let us there. Yeah, it's I, good. I think it's fuck great. Them. Like, fuck, we have no real problems as yeah. snowboarding. It's a privileged sport. It's yeah. not like grimy or whatever. It's like fuck, these guys don't want to let us there. They want to be dicks to us. Like, yeah. cool. I like that they're, like, what is it? Snowboarding is better when you hated us? Yeah. It's right? better. We need a little bit of that. Like, we need, we still need those people to hate us. I love that yeah, part of it. That. That's the best part about filming in the streets. Like, it's like the fucking, it's the battle against, like, you know, showing up to the spot. Like, I mean, the snowboarding's fun, too, and the crew's fun, but, like, part of it for me was always, like, getting away with some shit. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, it's a fact. Getting, not getting busted or going back. And, like, there's a certain rush there for sure. There definitely is. is. Sick. That's sick. I never got arrested, though. I know people do. Nah. Certain people have bad luck at that. Me. I'm one of them. Yeah. I catch cases. I'm a catch case. Uh, You're the guy that uh, walks up to the car. Well, the, to the problem is, I am, no, dude. Stone, I try to talk to them, yep. and then they end up thinking I'm the ringleader. Yep. And then the, the I'm problem going was that down. Tech Nine gear was so thugging yeah, we looked like yeah. thugs. that you would show up with the resi beanie, the resi <laughs> tip that's sky high. <laughs> you I got, love, like, a, I love tech, a good reservoir tip, if you know what I mean. <laughs> the Tech Nine, like down to the knees. You're like these guys are like you look at buds. You're like these guys are causing trouble. Yeah, for sure. I would always you try profile. to talk them down. Cole would make me always go talk to the cops. You're the, yeah. you're the you talker. are good at you're it. You're the good guy. You're yeah. good at it. And a lot of time I used to. I've have seen luck. you pull it. Yeah. It, I mean, if you really count it up, you've probably been in an altercation with how many? Five hundred different. Yeah, cops. probably. Yeah. And you got arrested how many times? For snowboarding, only once. So, like, dude. Yeah. That's you're actually batting pretty, like point oh one percent. Yeah, I'm batting pretty. Pretty good average. Good. Yeah, you're fucking yeah. killing it. Right? Pretty good batting average, honestly. <laughs> Uh, you that I had another question for you, and it's a little bit of a downer question. All right, all right. Um, bringing up twos who we yeah. lost. Yeah. And maybe it's not even a question. I don't know. But that letter you wrote before yeah. you got there yeah. about, and, <laughs> and you can probably explain it better, but you kind of wrote a letter about transitioning to the other side, yeah. what to expect. Yeah. Was that like from, I mean, it was beautiful too. Like everyone Thanks. in the room was just blown away. This is during twos's yeah. ceremony. And he, he couldn't quite get there in time. I sent it to Benny to read for me. Yeah, and Benny read it in front of a group of, like, I don't know, there was probably 25, 30 people. Yeah, so props to Benny, number one. I don't think I would have trusted anybody but him to, to, read, to read it. it. Because Benny and I have been through a lot. Yeah. Like, he is my homie. Yeah, Benny really looks up to you. And he's, a, well, I look up to him. I yeah. mean, he's got a, one of the biggest hearts ever, you know? And the reason why he got into a lot of the shit he got into because he's fucking got a huge heart. Yeah. But, like, yeah, that that letter was just twos and I are, like, first of all, like, I talk to J2 every fucking day right now. And I'm not talking about in, like, a weird spiritual. It's more like I'm, like, what should I do here? Or am I too stressed out? And you don't get a better answer than someone who's dead. Yeah. And it's, like, you're taking that serious? I'm you're dead. You're in cackle. <laughs> I'm fucking dead, dude. Are you? Why are you taking Yeah. Shut up. Have fun. And so... When I wrote that letter to Twos, like Twos and I had been through some a shitload. We were roommates. We had traveled the world, been through his drug addiction, trying to get him to quit. I eventually came to my own piece because I'm like, he likes it. He's gonna be him. He likes it. Yeah. Fuck it. Let him do it. Like he's got cancer. That's Who cares? what I did. Yeah. And like, so we were homies. But yes, on the flip side of that letter, Twos, you know, maybe six months away from him passing. I saw a shift in twos where he started to look like a scared little boy in some ways when I would make him talk about he realities because like he would start to get this look in his eye. And I was like, oh, that whole letter was just about like, dude, I had studied this thing called the Tibetan book of the dead quite a bit done a bunch of retreats. It's written by Tibetans. They've studied basically what's called the Bardos of what, you know, you go through these Bardos when you die there's a certain amount of time that you go through these certain things, these realms, and it depends, depicts supposedly where you get reborn. So if you choose this red light, you end up in hell and you come back and you might be born again as a human in a really shitty thing. So writing him to that, I don't know if any of it's true, but all of it was about like just saying, hey, dude, just it's okay to go mm -hmm. and just go out fearless. Like if you can leave this world without fear, fear and die without fear. My feeling is because it's my experience in my life. If I approach and enter something without fear, I can be 
clean, like without residue. So my idea of writing that letter to twos was I wanted to help him with what I've learned and practiced and without making super dogmatic, because I was not trying to be dogmatic, like how can I help him just release and leave this world without any residue, without any fear, without any worry, without any needing to hang on for someone else too. Mm -hmm. Like when, so Benny read that letter, like it was a Friday. I was like out of the country. You know? Yeah. Flew back in Friday, called Benny. He's like, dude, you should get here. Cause he's going. So I got there Sunday night and J two, I talked to him on the phone on Friday for like two seconds. I'm like, Hey dude, I'm coming. He's like, I'll wait. Yes. I'll wait for you. And he waited. <laughs> and it was amazing. Dude, got there at night. He hung on. Got there. Literally walked in the door. It's his mom, his sister, her girlfriend, Benny. Were you there too? I had just left. Just left. Yeah, A couple sucks. people. And it was cool because, like, everybody knew their spot in that room. Like, mm -hmm. his sister knew, I'm going to take 10 minutes because I'm going to lose my shit. And I want him to stay. And she's brilliant. And thank you, Shana, because that's exactly yeah. your gift at that moment was to be like out the room. Cause I was walked into twos, held his hand, said, dude, I'm here. Yeah. I love you. It's okay to go, man. And I'm going to read this to you again. When you like everybody, like literally 10 minutes later, we're kind of laughing. I'm everybody was kind of bullshitting and twos was like, I'm like, everybody shut up. <laughs> sorry, sorry. It's okay, man. Good. I could lose it right now too. for Sure. <sighs> Yeah. Yeah. I'm good. So like we're there sitting there and like uh everybody was kind of bullshitting and I was like holding his hand and I was like I could see he was taking his last breath dude. So I was like walk over and I'm like, all right, like just whispering in his ear, like, dude, just remember, like, just let go. We love you and just when you die, just look for that white light. Like just be in peace. Like Cause he had already been talking to angels like a couple of days before people were like, dude, who are you talking to? He's like, Oh, you don't see the angels right there. Like telling me like I'm ready whenever I'm ready. Like he was ready and he fucking waited for me. I know he did. We were brothers, man, straight up. So I'm sitting there. I'm like, it's good to go. And he went and he took his last breath and you know, what was really trippy is everybody kind of left the room and it was just me. And I read the same letter I read the Tibetan Book of the Dead, which is what you do to someone who dies in this practice. You read this, th read them through the bardos of what to look for and where to not go. And if you were to bring it all down to a m just one statement, just look for the white light. It's not actually white light. It's clear light. But you look for that, and then you can, you know, be in, in peace. But um, so I read him that, and within in two hours, like, he was just, it was just a shell he was gone. Like his spirit was somewhere else. And he looked so fucking peaceful, dude. And like everybody at the room was like his sister and all the people, his mom was like there and they were like, I thought I was going to be a wreck, but I feel really good about this. Right now. Yeah. Cause it was such a sick moment. I saw him see the light too. And yeah. it was crazy. Yeah, I mean, he was just, he went and he, I mean, you cannot fucking deny J two wherever he was at, like with snowboarding, he was the, the man and the boss and the humor and the coolest when he was in the drug world, I guarantee he was the man, the boss, the coolest. Yes. And he saved fucking countless lives Yeah, and showed them, even if they all died of drug addictions or whatever mm -hmm. he was dealing with, they all saw someone that was like so unique and real. Yeah. Life changing, human. life changing human, dude. You know what he called those people? No. Grandpires. Yeah. <laughs> Which is such a sick they, name. He loved him. <laughs> I mean, he fucking was such a dope guy. I mean, and so, yeah, I mean, that's, that's kind of that letter was just more of an attempt to be like, dude, to sum it up, like no one knows what's going to happen, but you lived your fucking life. Let's leave it without any fear and residue and like just be peaceful. Yeah, it was you sick. Know? It was so, dope. And thank you for Benny for reading that. Because yeah, Benny killed it with it. He did such a good job. He's a boss. For sure. Last thing to add is I, I fucking really do talk to twos almost every day. Like, I'll just, like, be like, hey, what's up? Like, and he just gives me the most hilarious advice. It's always a laugh. Shit, first. you know he would say is cackle that you can't ever yeah. forget. Yeah. I mean, his approach to life was that. So, it's you know, yeah. it still exists. He's not gone. Like, the dude is so strong in my heart. That is true. Oh, yeah. That's sick. Yeah. 
It was insane and special that he waited for you, though. That was Dude. really cool. What? I mean, fuck. Yeah. Thank you, man. That was cool. Only twos. <laughs> <laughs> I was so stoked I got to make it. And figures he would hang on to. That was nuts. I mean, we Waited. went through the real shit, like through all the hard shit. Yeah. Yeah, same here. With like, him. we never, we got to a point in his life where I would talk it at him sometimes, like, and he would go into this mode of, like, the, like, I mean, twos to me, the thing that made him unique really was that he was born into a situation where his parents loved the shit out of him. Yeah. But he was free reign probably from the moment he got from the hospital. He was, like, he made up the world. <laughs> yeah, free range twos. And, like, <laughs> so... I learned so much about like that from him. So like mutual yeah, give live, and take. Uh, and when I would talk dad at him, it would be always be like, dude, you can't fucking, you know, be doing math for fucking two days and sleep for two days. Like you got to get up. <laughs> yeah. Let's go eat some mocha. Let's do some shit. The thing that's a trip about that is his temperament never changed. Whether he was pro snowboarder twos, photographer twos, yep. drug issue twos. Yep. You'd see him at the Jack Club <laughs> and he'd be, uh, he, he'd see you like it was, oh, he, he called me Palm Springs, Palm Springs, how you doing? <laughs> so awesome. And, uh, but that's like, th that speaks to his character. Cause sometimes you see people when they're on their high yeah. horse and it's yeah. even, it's just, yeah, he always took you at consistency value. of character at all times. Yeah. It always shocked me when twos, you know, 90% of the time he took people at face value and which he did. Yeah. And then 10% of the time there was some people. And I couldn't ever tell who it was going to be. You just didn't like him. And that means there's probably something up with those it's people. It's kind of like a dog. Dogs know sometimes. Yeah, yeah. Dude, I was just going to say that. So there were certain people. But also Dogs my know. hair my hair stood up around a few people that we won't mention that Twos was down with. So it was like, yeah, hey. and, you know, mutual. Yeah. And maybe that was just in his later times when he was hanging with some sketchier people. Well, I mean, no, it was more like some people in the game, yeah, too. Uh, but, like, certain people. But, like, also, like, with him, like, I would when he would – not like someone, I'd be like kind of shocked because he got along with like a fucking yeah. anyone. Yeah, he and really never did. judged people. Yeah, he never judged ever until it was someone who just he was just like, mm, yeah. Wow, and then he's just like, that guy. yeah. And that would always make me be like, yeah. it's got to be something up with that guy. Totally, that's yep. funny. Yeah, yeah. He was a G though. Totally, man. Um, yeah, I haven't got upset about twos in a while. That's crazy. I it's guess good it's to get no... a good cry yeah. out, man. I almost lost it too. I think that's I what had to started me because I saw you start to lose. <laughs> I can it. lose it, and honestly, to me, like, <laughs> dude, the mo one, the best thing I've ever seen. Uh, top three. My friend Ryan one time was like, literally lost it in front of a group of like thirty people and cried as hard as he could. Yeah, and it was top three coolest shit I've ever seen. So you doing that right now? Props. Dude. Yeah, fuck it. So I we love gotta, it. Let's hit an air horn on that air horn. Maybe a gun showing show real emotion. Is couple of shit. shit. Yeah, yeah, man, that stuff's. I think. Do I want to open up this can of worms? I've been. I was kind of thinking. What's the can of worms? I was just was thinking about death. Okay, fuck. Oh, it. I was gonna get it, deep, dude. and I do believe now in this research and seeing twos and what he was saying, what he was seeing, listening to a lot of podcasts. Death is nothing to be scared of. Yes, yep. it's just another phase. Everyone's gonna die. Yep. No way around it. Yep. Everyone's doing it. Yep. Everyone's and, doing it. One way ticket. Yeah, it's a one way, <laughs> a one -way ticket. ticket. We're all and gonna die. Like, yeah, people forget. Not that. in a hurry. I mean, Willie kind of said this. Yeah. Not in a hurry to get there. Personally, yep. I want to enjoy this as much as I can. Me too. But I personally am not scared because I believe there's got to be more. Yeah. Something's gonna happen. I don't know whether we're energy, whether whatever it is, we're I all agree. gonna go through it. You know? I agree. It's a one way ticket. My personal take is one way ticket. No one fucking knows what's going to happen after. No one gets out alive. No one gets out alive. But it can be your biggest, like the one reason why I love talking to twos about it is it's so close to my heart and I can get that advice and the reminder, whether it's just my own mind, I don't know. Like who's to, who's to say this isn't, this conversation is my own mind making shit up right now. True. But Because who knows all this parallel universe shit yeah. they're figuring out right now. <laughs> Who knows? They've already proved mathematically there's seven parallel universes yeah. happening right now. Mathematically. Minimum. Yeah. Mathematically. But I'm, let's not go there. But the death thing, I it can be like the ultimate, I don't want to say motivator, but like I remember the first time I ever got to meet a real Zen master was here and this guy who's like a Zen teacher and someone I really respect. Like 
you know, and I sat down. I was like, I want to, I was the new guy, like a couple years ago. I want to take my Zen back. Yeah. Seriously. Give me the hard shit. He's like, oh, you want to get the hard shit? Okay. And he was fucking with me now. That I know. <laughs> but he's like, look at your death. He's like, that, everybody, if we woke up every morning and we're like, I'm going to die for sure. Because we are. Yeah. What the fuck do I want to do? And it, we don't know when the fuck it's coming. Mm-hmm. And I really wish I could take that fucking advice. Every fucking day. I don't. Yeah. There's plenty of days I literally get to the end of the day or the end of the week or the end of the month or the end of the year and fucking be like, what did I just do? Yeah. I don't even remember any of this shit. Yeah, I basically blew it. I, did, I was <laughs> fucking terrified to do anything I wanted all year. Mm-hmm. It's so, so death true. should be the ultimate thing. We Motivator. should literally wake up every morning and hit the feet, hit the ground. I'm going to fucking die. What do I want to do? Yeah, what am I going to do? You know, it's an interesting I gotta one. got to get this done. With my grandparents, rest in peace, my grandmother on both sides. Uh, but my grandmother on my mom's side, she was religious, Catholic lady. And when it was her time to go, she went super peacefully. Mm-hmm. And my dad's dead, my grandmother Mimi, she not religious at all. And she really... Really struggled bucked and, and it. really buck, bucked against it. And yeah. it's something about that. Uh, call it what you want, spirituality, religion, but have, finding peace in a, yeah. in a higher thing. That's yeah. kind of kind of cool to, to see that and whatever. Uh, yeah. And it's like at the end of the day, I'm just trying to. I got a crazy rat trap between my fucking ears. Yeah. Most and people I, do. I'm just, I'm just trying to fucking keep this thing from self-sabotaging yeah. myself Ooh. at all times. Yeah. But, yeah. I mean, I, however you could find peace, mm-hmm. you know. Find uh, that's, it. It, that's what's dope. Like yeah. for me, it's then, it, you know, and like some shit I like to do, like hike or whatever. But like for you, it could be your, ca- your grandma, Catholic. My dad's Catholic. Like he loves going to church. I go with him on, you know, I'm not saying he's the, like the most religious guy in the world, but like he finds peace there. Like cool. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Whatever. However you want to do it. Like, you know, every form of religion, they're all really kind of saying the same shit. At the end of the day, like they're, you know, a lot of them claim to know what the fuck they're talking about. My personal belief is no one knows what the fuck they're talking yeah. about. But if you find peace in it, that's cool. It's funny when you break down all this stuff because you got whether it's religion or spirituality yeah. or it's being vegan or yeah. it's being sober yeah. or it's being whatever compartmentalizing <laughs> yeah. version of yourself of you are. People love. Myself included, guilty as charged, but you get on your soapbox yep. and you talk about how fucking this is the way to do it and your way is not right. Yep. And it's like, yep. whatever fucking gets you there. Yeah. You know? Yeah. But, I mean, I think the other thing that I think is really true that I've, I try to really remind myself is like actions speak louder than words. Yep. So, like, you could be going to church every Sunday or being into Zen every fucking morning and be a fucking dick or you can do none of it and be nice. I'll take the nice person every fucking day. Yeah, and I right. think anybody else would. Yeah. So like whatever, man, Total, like, totally. Be, and not be, be fake. Nice. I mean, yeah. be nice to yourself first and foremost, and then be nice to other people. Cause the people that are on the soap soapbox being nice to other people, and then they're the ones that beats their dog at home. Like, that happens all the time, too. Yeah, there's a lot of that. Be nice. I'm my, you know, I want to be nice to myself so I can be nice to other people. Yeah. You know yeah it's, I mean? it's like a lead by example right. or something more, well, so, yeah, more sure. so than, or uh, attraction rather than promotion is kind of like whatever lifestyle. If you're, if you're living your good life. How people, do you want to die? People are going to be like, yeah. How do you want to go out? How do you want to go out? I know how I, I want to. I, go I'll out. T- I can tell you. Right, I tell you right now. I, I want to die. I want to. I, I have this vision, and I'm. I fucking hope it happens. <laughs> I want to awesome. be like ninety years old. Right. Okay. Like old, fucking old as shit. Like just like shriveled up old. Yep. You yep. know what I'm saying? Yep. Yep. Like, and I want to fucking throw on like a fat like ball to you fall. This old thirty two jacket I had, like <laughs> thugging desert camos, like some Sick. fat desert camos. Mm-hmm. And like, I just want to go to the top of like the like the biggest rail I can find in the park. Oh, okay, at like, ninety at, at ninety, and just drop in like kids looking at me like, holy shit, that guy's super old. Hmm. And just like come in full speed and just clip on a back lip <laughs> and just like back taco the flat and like break in half and die awesome. on the did battlefield. Die on, die on the battlefield. Did you? Already I've, have I've this had plan? this, but die on the battlefield with some fucking honor, like oh braveheart. That's you know what I mean? pretty sick. 
Don't you think? Yeah. Well, that's not how I want to go, but that's cool. <laughs> well, let's okay. hear how you want to go before I say, because I'm not sure yet. I'm still okay, thinking. well, mine's age wearing same as you. Everything else completely Age opposite. wanes? Or? Age wanes. <laughs> My eyes was. So I want to go same age group, whatever, old as yeah. fuck. I was thinking more 85. But I want to be in a tough. rocking chair on a porch on a f- late summer day. Mm-hmm. A lot of like crickets that kind of like almost turning like hazy summer to fall vibe. But still like warmish in my rock chair. And I want to be like, hey, I'm going to go take a nap on the rock chair and I'm not waking up. Yeah, see, I was along those lines. But I just want to like (laughs) peacefully fade out. And I think, you know, you know how like babies come Mm -hmm. into the world and they're like in this dream world before they learned all kinds of shit. Yeah. And they're just like, and old people, if they get to be old enough, all this shit where they're talking about people, old people, like, it's so sad he's losing his dementia. mind and forgetting it. I think dementia can suck, yep. but there's a certain form of dementia, too, where you, like, start fading into the ethers while still alive that you came out of and into, and then you're leaving back out, too. I wouldn't mind being a, having a bit of that, like, spacey old, like, so, so it's a smooth, rather than this shocking, like, terrified transition out. I'd like to be, like, Kind of phasing out, like a dith or dissolve in premiere. Yeah, yeah. Just like I like to kind of. You see, I'm dissolve. like that. I would like to go in my sleep peacefully yeah. with people I love around me. I totally. Guess. Yeah. I want to make sure all my pieces have been said. There's still said. some people. Yeah. There's people I like. I think still maybe have beef with me. I don't yeah. think I have beef with anybody. I was gonna say that's crazy. Not again. beef, but maybe I said some shit that I didn't even mean, or yeah. I, w- I It's gonna happen. Yeah, it's kind of. But I would love life. to have like, if there's any bullshit, all of it checked off. Big stuff, especially make your amends. They call. I kind of have with a lot of people. Yeah, which is a smart move. It's like why hold those grudges? Yeah, man. I ha- I am fortunate. I had a lot of head injuries, so I can't remember most shit that's happened. Really, ever? Like people will tell me about a trip I've been on, like, and you don't even remember. I'd be like, remember when we went to Chile for like a month? I'm like, yeah, we got drunk. Okay, we did this. You did that. Nope. No, no, no memory I of the whole trip. We're in, we're in the same boat. Yeah, I was gonna say he's. I've, had, too? I've had ten concussions, and you don't remember. And shit. It's interesting what you were saying earlier. I yeah, my memory section of my brain scan was like the lowest it could be. You got a brain. And scan. I got a brain scan. I actually yeah, he and, went and did some shit. Circling back around to what you said about people leading by example, right? Mm-hmm. Um, a friend of mine, John Overson, had some bad concussions, and he was like kind of a wreck. He was having a hard time working. Like he actually. <laughs> he was really in a bad shape and we were talking and he ended up finding this place and going. And I just saw him after I just saw his temperament (laughs) and he was just happier. He was clear headed. I just, it wasn't, I didn't need to be sold on it. I just like you're saying. And so I went and I, I spent a bunch of money and did a lot of uh, cognitive therapy and was able to get my brain back from uh, basically very, very damaged. Actually, out of the out of the 14 people that were in this brain, um, whatever, cognitive therapy place, I had the worst scan wow. out of everybody, and they were all there for car accidents and everything else. And so I went from this, like, basically, it's a one through five scale. Everybody else, the highest was a two. I was a 3.5 on that wow. scale of severity. I got my brain back to a zero from That's doing awesome, all kinds dude. of cognitive therapy. And, wow. and the memory stuff, you can... Like it's you can exercise it. It's kind of like a bicep in some ways. And yeah, I think you're way, right. I mean, a lot you... of my memory is that I think like a J, like that's awesome. Yeah, J two. I know you know this, but I heard every story J two had to tell a fucking hundred times. Yeah, <laughs> and I, in the middle of a conversation, like literally, that dude would start telling me alone the same story he told me four times, and I'd be like, "Hey, dude, you've told me this four times." And he'd keep telling yeah, me Yeah, he story. doesn't care. But I don't tell <laughs> a lot of stories, so that's another reason why I don't remember a lot of shit. True, yeah. Like, I don't... You, what about selective? Sometimes it's, it depends on where... I can be selective, where, too. Where it, uh, and also, that depends on what part of the, your, your noggin yeah. you smack. Yeah, too. I mean, Also, I heard another fact that, like, something about, like, 50% of the shit that we remember is inaccurate or something. Like, I the way the it. way we... Especially the way it pertains to like maybe the way you romanticize about an old relationship or something yeah. or like things like that where yeah. you're like oh, you think things were awesome yeah. but you your brain's morphed it to be something what it was. Yeah, what I've I'm been thinking it. about that a little bit lately I, too. Yeah, like, like you, some of the shit at relationships I was in, I was like, was it really ever good or was it just <laughs> about what? Yeah, you know what was it? Yeah, I totally backed that. Yeah, 
and just even facts. Remember like, the hot points or mm-hmm. the cold points. Or, yeah, you just remember the good stuff mostly if it was yeah. a good relationship. Yeah. That's or the shit, you know, whatever. Yeah. yeah. That's interesting. I back that. I mean, you can't possibly. Why would you want to remember everything? Yeah. Talk? But I hear you. Your brain only has so much like gigabytes. It's, it's like a hard drive. You yeah. know what I'm saying? It's like you got a four terabyte hard drive. You don't put so much shit on there. No you need shit. to get an You know, and then you hit your head a couple of times and get downgraded to like a fucking one terabyte. And then you're like me and Mikey and you're sitting at like an old fucking ru- lacy that's like 10. You got to plug it in. It's got 10 megabytes. It spins a little slower. <laughs> it's pretty relaxing, actually. I don't need to fucking remember shit. I mean, people sometimes get pissed. I don't remember. Yeah. But fuck it. I haven't had concussions and I have that issue to selective memory. Well, Bud's actually just I got a concussion. Got my this first week. one, yeah. I it got could a car just be wreck, that you dude. don't give a fuck about anything. Me too. I mean, I, a lot of times I don't give a shit. To That's care. what I think it is. Yeah, my sometimes my family will be like, "You remember this?" And so I'm what? Like, I have no idea what you're talking about. Yeah, you got busted up in the car, huh? The full totaled the vehicle. Damn. You get t boned Um. Yeah, it was like three cars. Someone ran a light. The Damn. car is fucked up. Looking, now my dude. car's fully totaled. Wow. Crazy. Yeah. Gets you thinking about life, though, because they're safe these days, though. I'm backing those airbags. What kind of car are you? Subaru. Yeah. Subarus are good. They so we say give they're a, one of the safer air, ones. Give yeah. Subaru a little air horn? If you want to sponsor a Subaru, I do need a new whip. Hit us up. <laughs> <laughs> we get an agent to maybe track down one of those let's, deals. Let's track down a little Subi deal. Yep. I'd ba- like a personally a, a Chevrolet deal myself as yeah, well. Whatever people want to throw at us, we'll take it. Yeah. I'd like a Toyota deal. <laughs> get, get us all one. So we have three for three dealer, for Thursday. Dealer choice. Get us all a whip. I, I feel like we kind of did it. What do you think? I do got one more question. Okay. A snowboarding question. Okay. Um, let me pull it up here. This is from Alex Alert or Alet. What up, Alex? Make sure I get that. Yeah, Alert. And he's another Patreon dude. He's just curious what boards you're riding now. Uh, I have a quiver, man. And that's oh, kind of what guy. he was wondering. Do you ride guy. different boards for different conditions? Or? Yep, yep, yep. Yeah, so what, I got, what are you into? What's big Mike in now? I mean, I've been running the Jones Storm Chaser, which is their short little fucking pow board. I hear a lot about that board. It's 47. I tried the 43. is a little small. The 51 or whatever. The bigger one was too big. That thing in on a pow day is, I'm sure there's a million good pow boards, but yeah. that thing... It has this tiny little short tail that's super stiff. So it rails on hard pack, but on pow, it's going to be like 100 feet of flat and three feet of pow and just really? right over it. That's dope. And it just shreds. Like, so if you're dropping it on like a steep zone, that little tail, you're like turn. You know how it's you like can, a labor you can turn yep. real quick. That board's my number one. Float. Yeah. Because uh, I'm, I'm like also at the point, FYI, minimum 12 inch power roll. I'm. Um, there too. I don't fuck. <laughs> yeah. That's some spoiled fuck shit. Fuck that. That just comes with age. I like, don't care. You'll get there. Like, you'll I'll go there. with my dad to Sunday River or, like, if it's, like, yeah, my kid wants to go learn, cool. But, like, pow day, like, that's where I'm at. So that storm chaser's the shit. If it is a fucking whippy whip around the mountain, I, like, I got this little United Shapes Horizon 40, also a 147. Sick. Six side cut. Almost scary how good... It almost turns too well. Like, I get freaked out, but that makes it fun on a hard pack day. day. Um, what else have I been riding? Toboggan. Well, Dude, toboggan. actually, I, that was another thing on my list. Let's toboggan. talk about the toboggan. The tobogganist. Tobogganist. I was with you when we found the first one. In With fucking Benny at the yes. fucking bar? That was sick. In New York. Yes. But, yeah, that was totally on my list. I forgot to bring it up. That was cool. One so, last story. The one tobogganist. One last story. Toboggan. Obviously, that like any good thing was not premeditated. Organic. So I was at a fucking resort. I don't remember where we were. Yeah, we were Probably don't York. want to name it because yeah. we stole the toboggan. That's true. But like this kid was in the, crying in the parking lot. Someone was like, oh, this poor kid got his board. So I'm like, oh, cool. Like I'm taking my bindings, but here, take my snowboard. Went back to my board bag. I'm like, oh, I actually don't have another snowboard. <laughs> Benny, let's go to the bar. <laughs> so we went to the bar, drinking some Guinnesses. I look up at the wall. It's like shining light of the Coors Light toboggan. And I'm like, Benny, like, can you can you grab me that thing? Like he's like, Yeah. I was like, get the bartender, like distract him. So the bartender, I like pulled him over to the side. Benny rips it off, goes out the fire door, it fucking turns on the alarm. We fucking get out of there. I go home and screw some like twenty five wood wood screws into the ride bindings are dope. The metal ones have all these little holes. So and then we just proceeded to see what the 
toboggan could do. And it did. The kid got busy on the bog. The bog that thing was Dude, I wanted so I wanted to try to find a photo of you on it, but I think two shot two's, them off. I have the original. Oh, you do? Okay. Dude, we should Don't. tell a print let's, of that for sure because that one's... Let's I have those the, on the grand and show them ones. to the world. I'm yeah. sick that you have those because I was like calling up. I was like, I have, them. Shoot I have the like, fucking Hazy. I might even have the actual Hazy film, but I have digital scans of sick. But I'll that was up on that. definitely one of the, you know what it is, man. Like that's the fun shit. Yeah. Like the discovery going back to the kid shit. Like that took me right back to the hockey rink with my fucking yeah. two homies. at snowboarded in Maine. Like, what can this board do? This board is miserable. Like, let's ride. Like, it's you know, let's have some fun. Like, yeah, let's I mean, some shit. Yeah, <laughs> man. Let's go down fuck. a rail, whatever. <laughs> That's what snowboarding is about. Like, ultimately, not yeah. to be cheesy, but like, it's about like goofing the fuck off and having fun. And that toboggan, like those times are always the best times. That's so good to hear in an industry that's got the Olympics and the X Games that everybody takes themselves so seriously. And all that shit it's, is serious. There's big money. There's big stakes. There's Your life's at stake if you're chucking a fucking yeah. 1440 on an ice jump. But like at the end of the day, like if you can find that play moment too, that shit is fun. Like the shot that you showed me that Bob printed. Like yes. Riding that 140 Burton Where are those? Elite. Hold that thing up. Oh. Twos. Twos is what's up. Did Twos do it again? Twos just knocked the damn picture off. I knew we were talking about him again. So Andy Wright had that board sitting in his garage. I'm like, can I borrow that? I think because that was my first snowboard I ever bought was a Burton Leap 140. I think in 86 with my paper money. I was like, let's. I want, and I went to the thrift store again to buy the whole kit. So I wanted to find the kit that looked like I was. Yeah, because you had those full, the full outfit on. I had the fucking knee pad, kid sweat, you know. Pants from the thrift store and the shitty jacket and the handmade so beanie. But, like, that was, like, I don't know, six years ago. But, like, doing that is so much more fun than being serious. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's what's up, man. That's what's up. I'm glad we remembered the tobogganist because uh, that was totally on my list and I forgot. Yeah, that was fun, man. And also props to Shane because Shane Charleba, after White and those two, on that trip, I want to give mad props to Shane because to this day, if I'm gonna go snowboarding, that's the dude I want to call. Yeah, you holler for at all the reasons, mm-hmm. like safety reasons, fun reasons, hearing his Shaneisms reasons. Yeah. Like we're buddies. Always knows where to go. But like, talk about down to film at any hour, any time, um, any subject. Fil- and anything. this, like, yeah. he's like, he would. When I pull that toboggan, there could have been like, like Terry could have been like, I'm gonna do the first 1080 on a fucking. Whatever. He'd be with And he'd you. be like, I'd rather shoot the toboggan. And I have a <laughs> lifestyle of you with that kid on, and he's wearing that full jungle so camo kit. He's standing at the rail garden. So epic. Next to you. Yeah, at the rail <laughs> yeah. garden. His sense of humor. I'll have to is... put that shot in as well. <laughs> yeah, dude. Yeah, yeah, mad props to Shane. He's yeah. my get brother. Some air horns. We'll, we'll, double get him, air we'll get him in that seat. Double, double air, air horns. Horn. Horn. Yeah, we'll get Come him on. in that seat at one point. Yeah, he's, all, he's in the boat. Oh, Big hearts. Big hearts, man. Yeah. All right, I think we did it, man. Yeah, I'm boys. excited about this conversation. Cool. Yeah, dude. You guys are stoked. I'm stoked. I'm hyped, dude. All right, well, Mikey, thanks for coming <laughs> fun, on our man. show. We Total really pleasure. appreciate it. Hey, I I just want to say, I love this show. You guys are fucking crushing it, and it's I actually listen to these, which is rare because, like, you know, you want to tell your friends. Like Russ has a podcast too. I listen to a couple yep. of days. Air horn. Russ, my brother, straight up. But uh, this is legit. You guys are killing it. I fucking love it. And keep doing it. This is, like, real. Coming from And it's you, finally, man, like, so dope. telling the deep story of, like, what, you know, it's what's up. So, Let mad people props. know what's up and who yeah. these people are. Yeah. And Two good dudes. Fucking love you guys. So Hopefully you. show a side that have people haven't seen, you know, of, yeah. of writers. It and is, man. Industry sure. people. And- well, it means and the you world, you check Mikey. all the boxes. It means the damn thank world. You, yeah. Well, thank you guys so much for listening. Like always, we will see you next week. Peace. Bomb hole. Yeah, Mike. Woo! Let's go. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, guys.